is a presentation of the iRacing Esports Network. So, you want to race in NASCAR. The road starts here. Introducing the eNASCAR at Night Series powered by iRacing. This is the gateway for all aspiring 13 to 16 year olds. Starting June 20th, ignite your dreams of one day racing in the top tiers of NASCAR. Go to www.iracing.com slash ignite for full details. So what are you afraid of? Those feelings are made of. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. Four more kilometers. Oh, there we go! Oh, there we go! This time, like the last time, I'm moving so fast, I'm ready to run. Cronky! Stop the insider hooking off! Passenger throws the block, and he will keep him behind him. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Lower the lights down. Hand over my crown. To say this has been a topsy-turvy season is an understatement. There's only one other competition going on in the world right now that might have had the amount of drama, confusion, intrigue and surprises as the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series in 2018. But let's not talk about that. Let's focus on Imola. Welcome to Italy. And even though this is a track that has only ever hosted the San Marino Grand Prix. Welcome to Imola. Welcome to the track that has had fantastic racing over the years. And of course, the heartbreak of 1994, losing Roland Ratzenberger and Ayrton Senna in the space of 48 hours. Today, drivers will take on this very fast track as qualifying is already underway. With Will Vincent here, Jonathan Simone and Jake Sperry live on the iRacing Esports Network on Racebot TV, on Facebook Live and on Twitch TV. Let's get ourselves ready to go qualifying here at a track which today, let's be honest, is about as warm as everywhere else in the world, so to say. 78 degrees Fahrenheit, 49% race relative humidity, clear skies, seven mile an hour winds. That means, Jake, we have got ourselves a little bit of a greasy, greasy track here today. It's a hot one and a driver who is no stranger to the heat, Joshua Rogers, the Australian, has got himself on the pole as things stands. 118.271, 28,000, no, sorry, I'll correct myself, 27,000 second, now only 1,000th of a second ahead. Was ahead of Martin Cronke, the very man can move up just a thousandth away from pole position now as this 15 minute three lap qualifying session continues with Gregor Hutu, the five time champion on a lap. Yep, here is Gregor Hutu, number six. Team Redline, Fnatic Team Redline machine heading in towards Ravatsa number one as we speak now. On the exit of Ravatsa number two, there used to be a chicane here. That doesn't exist anymore. It's flat out to the end of the lap. And for Gregor Hutu, he is going to go up onto a lap of P number four then for Gregor Hutu for the time being. So it's Rogers, then Berryman, then Kronke, then Hutu. Ellis Jr. in fifth place. Ilka Harpala moves himself up into seventh for the time being. Mitchell De Jong, joint championship leader. We'll talk about that one in a moment's time. He is on a lap right now, Johnny, and he is looking to go fast. Yeah, he's very quick here, Mitchell De Jong around Imola. 
And last year's pole time, though, went to Martin Kronke, the man who should really be leading the championship but wasn't for a bit of bad luck. De Jong here on a quick lap through the middle section, heading into this corner, which we've spoken about over the years, the Variante Alta, turn 11 and 12, a corner you never seem to get right, especially in qualifying as you're searching for every tenth of the lap. The downhill braking zone of Ravazza to end the lap, very easy to ruin your time around these last couple of corners. Brilliant for Mitchell De Jong, but will it set him apart on pole position? Yeah, we have got some issues there with that graphic at the bottom of your screen. He's not managed to do the lap in 20 seconds. Let's have a look then for the driver of Mitchell De Jong. He goes up into seventh place then for the time being. So not a great start, but note the fact that Koala traditionally do go better on their second lap. Drivers not to have qualified. Marcus Jensen, Ricardo Orozco, Tommy Ersgaard, Paul Ilbring, Stephen Michaels, Kazuki Omashima, Mogar Filo, and Dion Verges. 26 drivers here today at this event. Apparently there's a couple of other events going on around the world that might have taken people's attention away. But we want to thank you, the race fans, for checking us out here on the iRacing Esports Network here. We've only been on for a week. I'll tell you one thing, we've got a fantastic battle in terms of qualifying. Two oh. drivers from non-teams as Marcus Jensen moves himself to the top of that. Now we've got ourselves three drivers separated by one one hundredth of a second. Marcus Jensen, number 12 machine. Josh Rogers, number 92 machine. And Peter Berriman in the number 69 car separated so close together. And these are three drivers here, Jake, who are not a part of what we like to call the established two of Redline and Coanda. First Esports definitely making themselves big contender today. 1-2 as things stand at the moment. And talk about the deals that have happened since the last event, Will. They've brought in a new sponsorship, which has brought them 100,000 over the next three years. They've got a media partnership now with Red Bull. They are starting to move up. And Josh Rogers moves up just like that. 118.154 to the top of the timing sheets. Kronke still waits in pit road. He could change things. Hutu could change. Berryman could change. And right now, Mitchell De Jong sitting on a 118. Team four, his championship tied for points at the top. He needs more than that. Ellis Jr.'s lap's done as well, Will. He can go no higher than sixth. Yeah, indeed so. So let's go back then to the Apex Racing UK machine of Peter Berriman as they work themselves, well, he worked himself even, down towards the second of the chicanes, the Villeneuve chicane. Really fast on entry, slow it down for the centre of the corner. Berman almost seemed to slide across the track there, Johnny, as if the car just wasn't going forward for a couple of moments there. Yeah, I know exactly. Here's a section of the track, though, that is blind and difficult to get right, of course. Heading through. And Piratella is all good. Aqua Minerale here, 9 and 10. Straight line this as much as possible. Trail break on the throttle early. It's uphill, so you should be able to carry as much traction through there because of the gravity and the Variante Alta, of course. You want to... Uh, widen the track where you can. Berryman very clean through here. Now Berryman has a pole position to his name. Don't forget Will in the World Championship. It was at Monza last year and he has a chance here at Imola to do the same. Two in Italy possible for Peter Berryman. Yeah so here is the JCL Apex Racing UK machine then. Out we're about to two. You're flat out to the line from here. What's it going to be for Peter Berryman as he crosses the start finish line? Will he get pole position? The answer is yes he will. 118, 139. So now it's Apex Racing UK number one. Second and third place to Burst Esports. Martin Cronke is on pit road. Gregor Hutu is on a lap. Mitchell De Jong is on a lap as well. On board then with the driver of Mitchell De Jong in towards Sambarado and that first chicane then, Jake. Yeah, that first chicane so difficult. Don't go over the anti-cut curves. They can be absolutely nightmarish for a lap time. Jensen on a lap as well as he heads himself through Ravatsa 1, looking for Ravatsa 2. The Danishman, the Dane, sorry, shall I say, looking to make that charge to the line, looking for that little bit more. A tenth needed to get past Peter Berryman, who's looking for his third pole position, his second this season. 118.157. It's time improved, but not lap. Go back, though. Hutu now about to start his final lap. De Jong now making the charge as he heads himself to this fantastic section down the hill and then up the hill looking now towards the Variante Alta. Yeah so on board again with Mitchell De Jong number 24 VRS Coanda Simsports machine over the curbs and I think actually that was a slow second section but we'll have a look as soon as we can to get the lap time up for him. And yeah, indeed, we have got a bit of issues with our timing and scoring at this track. 
And we'll try and get it resolved for the race. But here then is Mitchell De Jong out of Revata 2 towards the start finish line. Can Kawanda get in the top two rows? The answer for De Jong as he crosses the start finish line is that it will only be P number four for him to outside row number two. But we still got then Gregor Hutu onto a lap. The action coming thick and fast here today as into Aqua Minerali will come the driver of Will Gregor Hutu. Slides it through the corner, Johnny, but good traction overall. Yeah, he did. He missed this race last year, so it's a track that we don't, we can't really base it off Hutu's career history. It was only introduced in 2016, early on. Whoa, loses traction at the exit of the Variante Alta. And unfortunately for him, that may have cost him an, uh, not too much time, but he misses the apex at the Ravazza curves or a scruffy lap for Hutu. He has to hope that this at least gets him onto the front two rows for a chance at victory. Yep, so here is Hutu. Turn our attention to him first. Crosses the start finish line. Was P number seven. Remained in P number seven. So nothing there for Gregor Hutu. Now we go back to Martin Kronke in the number five machine. Defending series champion as he heads himself over the curbs. Now down towards... Um, down towards... These final two corners on track, they're left-handed, they're downhill, you break as late as you possibly can. 16 one hundredths of a second, exactly, is what Martin Kronke has to improve by to get pole position over Peter Berriman. He's pulled it out the bag so many times in this series, crosses the start-finish line. Martin Kronke only up to fourth place. So, that means we've currently got Apex Racing UK on pole position with then a duo of Burst Esports cars and then a duo of Kawana Simmer Sports drivers, a second JCL Apex Racing UK machine in Jamie Fluke then in P number six. And then we go back and it's P number seven for Team Redline right now in what is currently a 26 car field on board of the driver of Ricardo Orozco, number 18 machine as he crosses the start finish line and Ricardo Orozco will remain in 18th place on track. That is almost qualifying done unless your name is Dion Verges, currently in P number 26 on track. Well, that is now qualifying done and Dion Verges moves up into P number 24. Qualifying is over and this series, Johnny, never fails to impress in qualifying in 2018. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we have a race on our hands right now. Berryman on pole, Rogers, his first ever career front row start. Marcus Jensen in third, uh, career best qualifying performance from him. Kronke and Diong, though, the two Kawanda cars, fourth and fifth, will preview all of this after the break, of course, in our pre-race show. But uh, this is, uh, we've had some entertaining grids in the past. This is up there in, uh, definitely in the top three grids of all time so far. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing. For those of you that want to watch the kickabout contest between England and Sweden, I think this might be just a little bit more exciting. But let's have a look then <laughs> at your provisional grid for this, the eighth round of the R Racing World Championship Grand Prix Series. And out front here today, it will be the driver of Peter Berriman, for JCL Apex Racing UK. And then behind, you've got two burst esports drivers, Joshua Rogers and Marcus Jensen. Martin Kronke in fourth, Mitchell De Jong in fifth. But look at this, you've got three drivers then at the top of your field, separated by just two one hundredths of a second. You've got six drivers within a tenth of a second because Jamie Fluke is in P number six in the Apex Racing UK machine. It is then an 800th of a second gap back to Gregor Hutu. So on a short track here and a fast track, it looks as like though Team Redline have struggled. And then you've got a bit more of a gap to the rest of the pack. And I am going to call him today the rest of the pack. Kevin Ellis Jr. in P number 8. He is a quarter of a second behind Peter Berriman. With Kazuki Umashima in ninth place for Radicals Online. And Yael Vaz rounds out your top 10. A third of a second behind Berriman. On to page two, and then you've got Gary Decor for the Orion race team at 11th place. Antoine Higlin in 12 for Apex Racing UK. Tommy Erskard, 13th for Coanda. 14th place goes to Orion with Ilga Hapala. And then Corsin Racing's Pash Gurgis rounds out your top 15. Banas Remnyek 
Michael Partington, Ricardo Orozco, Stephen Michaels, and Yuta Saito round out your top 20. <coughs> Have a look at this. 23 drivers within one second of your field. Qualifying at the rear of the field today is Daniel Beder in the positive sim racing number 29 machine. And he's only 1.2 seconds back from pole position. And what we see there is just how close the field is. And that means the margin to error on a track that can really, really make drivers' lives a misery is going to be fun to watch. We're going to take a quick break here on Racebot TV and on the iRacing Esports Network. Get ourselves ready for round number eight of the championship. We'll talk about the championship standings heading into this event, the implications of this race, and the grid. What a grid we have here today. We'll be back in just a couple of moments' time. So what are you afraid of? Those feelings are made of. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. Four more kilometers. Oh, they can't! Oh, they can't! Can 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 this time, like the last time, I'm moving so fast, I'm ready to run. Cronky! Sounds inside of Hoosie Soft! Passenger throws the block, and he will keep him behind him. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Lower the lights down. Hand over my crown. So, you want to race in NASCAR. The road starts here. Introducing the E-NASCAR at Night Series powered by iRacing. This is the gateway for all aspiring 13 to 16 year olds. Starting June 20th, ignite your dreams of one day racing in the top tiers of NASCAR. Go to www.iracing.com slash ignite. The hills of Imola throw up another fantastic, salivating grid for us. And this one has got itself a little bit of Apex Racing UK and a lot of burst esports at the front of the field. Peter Berman, qualifying time of a 1 minute 18, 1 at 3 9, gets himself pole position for this round of the championship. Josh Rogers, second place, third place, Marcus Jensen. Now, heading into today's event, this was how the kind of combined championship standings are. 494 points for Mitchell De Jong, 494 points for Gregor Hutu. That is after drop weeks have been taken, Jake, into consideration. Um, Matt Backham on 484. We'll talk about him in a bit. Or I'll just carry on talking for a moment then. Johnny, go ahead. I'll step in then if Johnny won't, but it's so fascinating, Will. We haven't seen a two-time winner this season in terms of back-to-back -back victories. It's not happened. It and at the moment, it looks like it's set not to happen. Martin Cronkay in fourth has got to get past Burst Esports, which look renewed. And after a few deals they've made, they're starting to get to the top of the mountain. Peter Berryman has been going from strength to strength. And his third pole position in his career, the second one this season, I think Peter Berryman looks like he's in great shape. But right now, what you need to look at is why it hasn't worked for Coanda on a circuit, which they have been unfallible in the past on. Yeah, I think more than anything else here, Johnny, it might be mm. less about Coanda slipping up, so to say, because let's be honest, Martin Cronke is within a tenth of a second, is within half a tenth of a second of Peter Berriman, but actually, because of the fact that Burst Esports and Apex Racing UK have continued to step up their game, just as we've seen them do throughout the 2018 season.
Yeah, I, I'm really impressed by this, especially like not just because of their age and how young they are, but Burst Esports is such a, a small team and they, they have been testing with other drivers too from other different teams and in th those kinds of privateer collaborations. So they're on the lookout for other drivers. And I'm telling you, Burst Esports, they have also made offers to other drivers as well. Not all of them have accepted them, but uh, they're certainly trying to create a, a sort of mark in not just the World Championship, but in the esports world. Uh, these kinds of performances here on the big stage, very important. You know, you've Josh Rogers' first ever career front row start for him in his rookie season. Um, man, we've got a race in our hands right now. Uh, Peter Berryman, we know from pole position, he can be very quick. Yeah, indeed so. So, 18 minutes then left until the green flag. A lot to talk about before then. Yeah, we have to chuck in a commercial break as well. Apologies, ladies and gentlemen. But 26 drivers here today. Um, I want to start off for a moment talking about that JCL Apex Racing UK team, Jake, because they have been good all season long. They're qualifying. Well, that one, they kind of really hit the ground running last year, but we had the, the questions about the race pace a little bit. This year, they seem to have got the race pace going in the right direction, and I think that over the next six months, and yeah, I'm already looking towards 2019, if your name's Alex Simpson, you got to really say by... Um, 2019, we want to have won a race. By middle of 2019, we want to be consistently winning races, but they are going in the right direction. They are, and I think they've got to be looking by 2021, 2022 to be having a championship. Otherwise, they're failing, personally. I think the Apex are in such a good position with young drivers. They are one of the best teams in the world today at finding and developing young talent. You talk about Sebastian Job at FA Racing G2. You're talking about the likes of Marcus Jensen, who has gone on to Burst Esports. You talk about Berryman, who's already there. You talk about Kevin Ellis Jr., who can prop up the team for 10, 15 years. And you're talking about someone like Jamie Fluke who will be around for a long time as well they do amazingly with young drivers and they seem to have this build which could work for the foreseeable future for them and I think Alex Simpson understands that he needs to build a core for that future and finally he's starting to reap the rewards of drivers who have been waiting for to fulfill that potential yeah but you make a really interesting point that you know, Marcus Jensen, who has gone to Burst Esports. And that seems to have been a thing. Over the last couple of years, they did have a bit of an exodus. And this is one of the difficulties with a team like Apex Racing UK. And there are a couple of others in the field as well. Radicals went through it for a while. ERT have been through it over periods of time. As you need to get more blood into the series, you kind of increase the number of drivers in your team. That's fine to an extent. But then some of the people who are quote-unquote established drivers do feel as though they're being pushed to one side some ways. Or sometimes there's not enough emphasis being placed onto their race results or what they need to do for the World Championship. And as a consequence of that, Jake... I do think that there's a really fine balancing line. I walked this one myself as a team manager. A really fine balancing line between having a lot of talent to develop and keeping the guys who you've established happy. I, I think it depends on what sort of style of racing you want. If you're a smaller team, say you're looking at this iRacing World Championship Grand Prix series, you're looking to try and find that key group of around five members you can put in and you can make challenges with throughout the season. You look at, say, an endurance team, you need probably about 10 to go and make something work. So you have two cars with four drivers that work well and you have interchangeable parts here and there. I think, Will, that teams have looked at trying to expand their rosters and I've seen teams like ERT have 30, 40 drivers at a time and that just doesn't work. I see teams that sometimes have 30, 40 drivers and 25 of them are just there developing their skills with 2K, 3K I rating who aren't going to reach those sorts of 1%, those 5K, 6K, 7Ks that move on for the future. I think Apex now have the balance right and they are exploring that balance right and it's also a balance that is seen going back to the likes of Kawanda who only have five drivers in this series to go and really push and attack. Yeah, we are going to show you the pole lap from Peter Berriman now. It's up on your screens. Johnny, give us a walk around this Imola racetrack. I mean, first you came nice and easy. Cut, Don't hit the anti-cut curbs, but the challenge really starts at Villeneuve. Yeah, it does. Villeneuve's a corner where you want to throw it into that first turn five, the apex. It's really the second apex you're slowing for. Uh, trail break into the corner. It's so easy to run wide onto the gravel. You see a lot of drivers do that and look out for that on the opening lap as well because drivers would try to make up positions there. Tosa turn seven, anti, uh, well, sorry, trail break, excuse me. 
up the hill, left-hander turn seven on the throttle early. Piratella's the corner wheel where it's a blind left-hander. You can't see the apex. You have to pick a brake marker and it can't just be a brake marker that could be knocked around during the race. It needs to be something static. It needs to be something that's not going to change for the whole event. Yeah, then you come down into what I think is one of the most difficult chicanes in any racetrack in Europe. And yeah, Imola's got three of them, which are pretty hard. And then you're down into Ravazza. Hold the curb. You can really run the curbs wide. I remember back in 2000, um, when Jensen Button came onto the scene, he said this was the hardest track he had to deal with because you do have to run a lot of the curbs here. That is Peter Berriman then, 118, 139 for him. We would also like to say, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget the iRacing Esports Network. We're hoping that you figured it out by now. The iRacing Esports Network is live. Please subscribe to it on YouTube. Great content from our friends over at V8 Online, as well as Live Sim Racing TV. And of course, us here at Racebot. Plenty more action, plenty more broadcasts to be added to the iRacing Esports Network over the course of the next few years. Give me a prediction for this event, Jake. New winner, and I think we're going to see Josh Rogers get his first win in his maiden season. Johnny. I, I agree with the, the new winner part, but I, I think Peter Berryman's got some good pace, of course, as well. So... Uh, let's see if he can lead away from pole and, and hopefully the Coanda cars. I think the key for Peter Berryman winning is the Coanda cars need to have a very poor first stint stuck behind traffic. And that could gain the 10 seconds Peter Berryman needs for victory. Because remember, he's finished within 10 seconds of victory a lot of races before in the past. It's time for me then to say this. Apologies there for the quick, quick moment we had there. Um, but you did see a fantastic look at the detailed work that goes with iRacing, of course. The look at Tamburana Corner, the Brazilian flag to represent Ayrton Senna and the moment that he unfortunately lost his life 1st of May 1994. This race is going to be spectacular. It is round number eight of the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series. It's here live on Racebot TV and on the iRacing Esports Network. And our race coverage starts next. So what are you afraid of? Those feelings are made of. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. More vocal love it. It's a big oh, oh, time. Like this time, like the last time. I'm moving so fast. I'm ready to run. Cronky! Sounds the insider hooks his off. Ottinger throws the block, and he will keep him behind him. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Lower the lights down. Hand over my crown. Hand over my heart. I do this for my town. I do this for my crowd. So turn me up real loud. My time. So, you want to race in NASCAR. The road starts here. Introducing the eNASCAR at Night Series powered by iRacing. This is the gateway for all aspiring 13 to 16 year olds. Starting June 20th, ignite your dreams of one day racing in the top tiers of NASCAR. Go to www.iracing.com slash ignite for full details.
the iRacing Esports Network welcomes you to this presentation of the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series presented by RaceBot TV. Welcome to Imola and the eighth round of the championship. For drivers, this is the last chance they have to make a mistake this season and not have it, well, fully affect their championship points. Because after this, every point matters. And for Command Sim Sports, maybe it's a bit of an omen for them. The fact that they've got one more chance to see how things are, work things out. Because today's front row of the grid hasn't got a commander or a red line driver on it. It's all about Apex Racing UK and Burst Esports. You have the top three positions in your starting field here today. We are in for a fantastic race here at what is one of the fastest tracks on the iRacing road schedule. This is Imola and the track conditions here today. Well, they are gonna make themselves for some very interesting racing. 78 degrees Fahrenheit, 49% relative humidity with clear skies and the winds have calmed themselves down a little bit. Robinson along with Jake Sperry and Jonathan Simone here. Want to give a shout out to Istvan Balau, Track Cams, 22.com and Andreas Warner and One Design for Overlay Design, Development and ATVO by Simon Grossman and Nick Thisson for Racebot TV live timing and scoring, which will be available throughout the course of the race. We normally talk about the calm before the storm here, Jake, and well, a lot of that calm is going to be keeping that right foot in the, exactly the right position in order to get off the start line. It's such a difficult start here as well at Imola, and it's so underrated how difficult it is. You have a start procedure where the track gradually turns to the left as it heads towards the Tamburello chicane, and a chicane where there is absolutely no margin for error, and you have 26 cars all trying to funnel themselves down to that section. I want to hark back to the iRacing Road to Pro series because it made such a massive, massive difference. If you kept an eye on that start, David Williams went from fifth to first by the opening corner. You can get great starts at this circuit. It is going to be a hodgepodge and a nightmare for vehicles, but it all depends on the good start, which Peter Berryman and Apex are traditionally known for. Yeah, this is a track as well, Johnny, where um, it is narrow. We talk about good starts by Apex, though. They have struggled a little bit in recent rounds. In fact, a number of teams have struggled in recent rounds of just getting that perfect bite point. So I do expect a lot of drivers to have been spending those anxious moments after qualifying thinking about, okay, what do I need to do from where I am to A, get myself a perfect launch, and then B, avoid what could be mayhem around me. Yeah, and, and one of the changes for 2018 was that you cannot deploy ERS before 100 kilometers an hour. So, of course, for the start as well, it relies on other aspect too. And, um, yeah, who knows? I mean, they have to make sure that the start is nailed correctly. A driver who never got that right was Sebastian Job, remember? Mm. Would have been good to have him on the grid. But uh, right now we focus on these other young fellows. Berryman Rogers on the front row, Jens in third. But it is your two-time champion, Martin Kronke, in fourth. De Jong in fifth, followed behind. We're forgetting about Jamie Fluke, isn't he? He's splitting uh, De Jong and Hutu. He's in a bit of a sandwich there with two greats of the game. Uh, Jamie Fluke is a driver. He's a very hard worker. He's a smart man. He could be a dark horse when it comes to strategy. This man does his homework. Yeah, very quickly, Johnny. I mean, this is a short track, but... It is one with only 26 drivers here today. That might help a couple of drivers in terms of finding a gap in terms of going off sequence. Yeah, exactly. You know, for that first stop as well, we look at the pit strategies later today. Uh, drivers will be pitting as early as maybe possibly lap, uh, lap 16 onwards. You'll see them for that three-stop window, but it should be a two-stop race as usual. 42-degree track temp, but it's pretty hot out there. But uh, if the drivers make it to lap 20, which they should, they should be able to two-stop this race. Now, the interesting point is, you make it to lap 23, Will, you can possibly, uh, well, not lap 23, excuse me, you make it to lap uh, 28, it's possible to one-stop this race just uh, under halfway through the event. So who knows? Uh, 23 is a bit early, but uh, the one-stop could work today if somebody tries to gamble. Yeah, we'll show you a starting grid then for this round number eight of the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series.
In fact, nope, we're not going to do that one just yet. We're going to talk for the next seven to eight seconds here, but the drivers will almost head themselves then down to the starting grid. Don't forget, you can subscribe now to the iRacing Esports Network and check out content by ourselves, Racebot TV, Live Sim Racing TV, and V8 Online from races around the world on road, oval, dirt, and rallycross. Subscribe to the iRacing Esports Network as we are just going to have to hit a button there for a moment and do one very quick thing. And we are almost ready to go racing here then at Imola. This is going to be a fast and furious race for 62 laps. The grid is going to run along the bottom of your screen. And at the front of it, you have... In fact, we can't sort it out, unfortunately. But it is Peter Barrowman at the front of your field here. As we are going to show that one now, hopefully for you. But it is Peter Barrowman at the front of your field here today as it will be Joshua Rogers and Marcus Jensen in second and third place. There is a look at your grid. They are almost all in position. They are almost all ready to go. Those lights are on on top of the iRacing.com gantry. Let's get this show on the road. 62 laps is underway. Very good start by your front row, but a bit of a better start then by P number four. That is Martin Kronke trying to go to the outside of Jensen in towards turn number one. It's all going to be drama here, but we've got one. Oh, we've got to drive it off. That's one of the burst esports drivers. And look at that already. We've got ourselves Martin Kronke up into the second position as it all started going wrong there for one of the burst esports drivers that's forward and back. That is Joshua Rogers. And he is now down into fourth place on track. Yuta Saito, Kazuki Umishima, both out in the early stages of this event. We'll talk about that one in a moment because we have got battling going on all the way down your field right now. But Johnny, it was a good start um, for a couple of drivers, but a messy start for Radicals Online and a very messy start and a costly start there for Joshua Rogers. Yeah, it was. Have a look at the lead, though. Is that Kronke trying to make a move ahead of Peter Berryman for the lead? So what happened at the start was De Jong rocketed off the line. So did Hutu, but they were boxed in by all the drivers in front. You talked about the narrow circuit, Will. And then Peter Berryman was way too hot on the brakes. It caused a bit of a chain reaction with Josh Rogers in second place. He was off the racetrack, and that allowed the two Coanda cars to get through. The worst possible start for Peter Berryman right now. The only good thing is he's still in first position but he's got two mad Coanda cars ready to reclaim P1. Yeah I'll tell you one thing interesting to note that Gregor Hootie didn't really gain that much during your first lap in fact he is in P number six there Jake as Marcus Jensen and Rogers have struggled on this opening lap so both esports got it right in qualifying did not get it right off the start line. Yes, but they've got time, Will, and that's going to be the crucial factor. No DRS just yet. That will happen at the end of this lap, the start of lap three. So for Gregor Hutu, that's where his worry's been. He hasn't been able to find the opportunity to make the move just yet on Marcus Jensen. But here's the opportunity then coming towards Piratella. Not close enough to go and make that move into the very, very difficult 90-degree left hand there. It's a lot tighter than you think it is. But right now, Will, it has to be said here. Drivers very much close together. They're all about within a second back to about Tommy Ersgard, who is having a really big scrap with Orion's Ilka Harpala. Yeah, so lots of little scraps going on as you have a look then as the drivers work themselves down on the X. Well, actually, they're just heading themselves now down towards the back. So, um, as we've had ourselves a couple of drivers out the event early. Most likely on pit road. Kazuki Mishima is out. We talked about that one already. Pascogis, Yuga Saito are out as well. So a bad start to this race there, Johnny, for Radicals Online. Yeah, not the start that they wanted for sure. Yeah, but the field's still working for it. Other teams still going well. Tommy Yoska, the Coanda driver, far from his teammates, but he's right behind that Radicals driver of Michael Partington, who's gained five positions. So uh, going well for Michael Partington so far. Uh, Yabaz, quiet start, of course, as well. Uh, I have to say, though, right now, we, we talked about that leading battle, the first eSport cars just... They didn't, they didn't do anything wrong, Will, at the start. They were just poured out by Berryman's mistake into turn one. I, I was clutching my, my fist in a second. I'm like, is Berryman going to hit the anti-cut here and just park in the middle of the apex? And he just saved it. So uh, Peter Berryman there, 
Uh, and uh, well, if he's a cat, he's got eight lives left, you could say. I'll tell you one thing. For Burst Esports, I think they probably would have hoped that he cut the anti-cut curve. Because that might have given him a better run through here. But as it stands, Berryman does continue to lead. And the gap right now is heading itself very close to one second, Jake. Of course, one second is where you get that DRS um, activated. So, And again, there we are. Peter Berryman now over one second, 1.1 seconds into Ravatsa. And that means Martin Kronke will not be able to use that DRS to try and get the extra little bit of help, shall we say, to hunt down Peter Berryman as DRS will be enabled on this lap. As also behind, we got ourselves Hutu trying to hunt down um, Jensen. Trying, but not quite finding. And uh, it's worth also saying, Will, that the last two times we went to Imola, it was a runaway victory for the man who won that event both times, Martin Kronke. So Kronke now very much the shoe is on the other foot right now, and he's desperately trying to stay with Berryman. Let's not forget, he's got championship contender Mitchell De Jong behind him. He's not going to be doing any favours today, Will. He's going to be looking to try and find a way through, get into second, keep that gap ahead of Gregor Hutu, and more importantly, stave off Martin Kronke. Kronke right now in second. He is the man who's got the most to prove at the moment. And right now he is under pressure. Yeah, we're actually on board of Mitchell De Jong as he heads himself down towards Aqua Minerale on this third, fourth lap of this event. We have got a little bit of issues with the onboard camera for Mitchell De Jong. So we do have to pay attention to that one. We can't show as many onboards as we'd like to, but we can go and show you Gregor Hutu over Marcus Jensen, not able to do anything. The amount of curve they take then through that third chicane is absolutely unbelievable, Johnny. And it's just, it's, I always wonder how many drivers are going to get suspension damage as a consequence of really yeah. abusing that. Yeah, I hate that corner. I don't even want to talk about it, man. Like that that corner you, you try to straight line it you bounce over it the setup's not going to do anything you you put as much fast damping on your car as, as possible fast damping really helps your car settle over high curbs and bouncy curbs the leaders head through turn one curbs like these where you need to rise both wheels over the top and then make sure you don't lose too much time you want to make sure the suspension isn't oscillating too much either you want to be as smooth as possible but you don't want to sacrifice the feel that you have in the car wheel and that's something that you have to give up to ride curbs at this circuit yeah we've been having a look at battle going on a little bit further down ricardo orozco versus yao vaz that is for p number 10 on track right now as they head themselves up the hill and uh, well ricardo orozco in this race here today and um, positive sim racing number 68 machine that's a good run down the hill but you really can't pass at this part of the racetrack jake you the only issue of this track is it can be difficult to overtake unless you are about a second lap faster than anyone else because even when you go into a slow corner the the track kind of cuts back on itself so quickly you've got to be really decisive in making the move I, I think there's not much that Imola can do about that because, of course, this is a very, very tight sort of setup for the overall circuit. There was always talks when Formula One came here that they always struggled fitting everything into the paddock at the back. There was always that issue. And for Ricardo Orozco, who's actually plus seven right now, trying to get past Yao Vaz, who recently featured on the Simone Racing Report podcast. Thank you, Johnny. I'll accept my, uh, accept my check later on oh, as okay. Orozco goes around the outside and comfortably makes the move. Yao Vaz had to back out of that, Will, because he had no other opportunity what i was going to say it's a very tight track in terms of uh, square area so there's not really much that imla could do i think they've done the best possible with the layout marcus jensen has lost a position to gregor hutu hutu now hunting down josh rogers um actually no i take that back i'll try and score it yeah um hutu is now up into p number five yeah. i am correct in that one johnny so hutu now is hunting down joshua rogers and the gap is 1.4 seconds now this red line car traditionally is very good in the medium speed section so in theory on race pace at least they should be good from the um, entry to Villeneuve all the way down to about now yeah exactly you're right there as well and what you need through that section from pretty much the tamborello all the way to the very ante alta is you want a responsive front end sorry i'm just having a look ahead there at josh rogers all over the back of mitchell de Jong. but you want the car to be responsive so every steering input you make you know 
as I said before, if you sacrifice too much responsiveness, it won't feel like you're actually driving the car. I feel like somebody else is. Here's Josh Rogers. Those burst eSport cars have a lot of straight line speed. De Jong blocks the inside, and that means Josh Rogers will remain in P4 for another lap. So that's something else I've uh, observed there, Will, is the burst eSport cars are the quickest in a straight line, and Rogers using all the ERS he has in that burst eSport car to the max. Yeah, that's not the most surprising thing ever, though, Johnny, because we do know that both Coanda and Red Klein, as I always say, like to take what I call the mid, uh, the middle ground, shall we say, in terms of your downforce. They don't want to go completely high downforce, but they also don't want to be the lowest downforce. They want to set their car up to run perfectly in clean air with a little bit of give for traffic, but not too much where they're going to end up having to overtake drivers only relying on their straight line speed. Yeah, and what's so difficult at Imola is that it's so difficult to overtake at. I mean, we've seen it over the years. The Road Pro Series was different. Jake and I were talking about that before the race, and that was just... You know, when you have a, it's like Formula Two, basically, you know, all these young drivers trying to make a statement. So different kind of series. But in a series like this, with the best talent in the world on offer, it's so much harder to overtake and, and crack under pressure. Kronke, by the way, within a second of Peter Berryman, I don't think he's deploying DRS at this stage. He didn't get but into the activation point. That's why. Here comes Rogers. Yep. And around and he makes it stick there. He's up into third. So let's get ourselves a replay of that one then for Josh Rogers. Jake, talk us through it. But he just got the DRS. He tried to make a lap earlier and had a very heavy defense from Mitchell De Jong. He was a bit more patient that time, went to the outside, went for the more difficult move, didn't try and go for the Banzai oh, glory attempt. He went for the basic and easy one and he made it stick as well. De Jong now back into fourth and look at his championship rival and equal on points behind him. Yep, so there's Rogers. Also want to show you um, what was going on with Jensen in this was into a turn of one gets himself passed there by Kevin Ellis Jr. Johnny. Yeah, oh by Jamie Fluke, excuse Jamie me, Fluke, you mean. That's so, yeah. The thing is, Marcus Jensen from lap one of this event, Will, is he just hasn't got into a rhythm. So I don't know if it's race fuel that's throwing him off because I always talked about it when I watched warm-up. You can sometimes get a feel for which drivers are going well in warm-up and how they handle the car. I thought Josh Rogers was going to have a bad race, and I, got, I guessed that wrong for sure. Uh, here they all are now heading into the Ravazza curves, the leaders. This has been a great race so far. We're only eight laps through. I'm loving this. Yeah, as in terms of retirees, we talked about them. We've got four, three drivers now out of the event. Moritz Lerner has come back on track, and I believe he is actually still qualified and classified within two laps of your race leader. Gronke has fallen back again, Jake. 1.3 seconds behind Peter M. He did get within that one second bracket, but I almost start to wonder then, did he try too hard pushing those tyres to get within one second and get the DRS, um, and then when it didn't activate because he missed the timing point to the activation that we were in one second, I think he just ended up overheating those tyres a bit. I disagree with you. Well, I thought it was Berryman having a couple of bad laps. And if you look at those bad laps that he was having, he did a 121.3 on lap number four. And then the next three laps afterwards, he was 21.8, 22.1, and 22 flat. He's now starting to pull that back a bit, Will. That was a 121.8 that he did that last time by. We expect tyre degradation to be high here today. But right now, Peter Berryman is starting to find that life back in the tyres. Where I thought that the tyre life he was showing was looking to indicate a three-stop strike. Strategy. Yeah, Hutu running in P number five is within half a second of joint championship leader Mitchell De Jong right now. So your two championship rivals are on track at exactly the same point. They're separated by four tenths of a second. They complete here lap number nine of this event, lap number eight of this event. Coming past start finish line, it was lap number nine they've completed there. Hutu has got himself there. Um, into fifth place, getting past one driver so far in this event. Roger's still running one and third, but you've got to wonder now um, whether or not it might be a situation, Jake, where Rogers starts to slow down some of these drivers, not by design, just by the fact that these first eSport cars have not had um, as fast race pace as we've seen, for example, from some of the other drivers around them. 
Well, I, I'm not sure at the moment because Mitchell De Jong hasn't shown any real sign of getting back into attacking Josh Rogers. And I think that if it was a case that Josh Rogers was actually slower, I'm not sure he would have made the move in the first place. I think he would have been dropping back a little bit quicker than he has been. So, no, I don't think he's slowing them down a bit at all. I think that Josh Rogers has work to do in trying to catch back Kronke, but Kronke's running ever so slightly faster at this stage. Who to maybe slowing down? And look how heavy over the curbs they are. Yeah, I mean, we saw we've got a beautiful shot there. We're going to show more of the drivers. And you see more curb there, Johnny, being taken by your front runners. They are really being aggressive. We've got a battle going on. Uh, I think that's Tony Erzgaard down in your field battling out with Ilka Hafala. Um, it's not really worth noting at this stage because they are separated now by about six tenths of a second. But um, as they can work themselves onto another lap here, um, it looks as though, yeah, there's Gregor Hutu. He's lost himself a little bit of time to Mitchell be on that last time around. But Kevin Lallis Jr., Marcus Jensen, they're going to go side by side in towards turn number one. And a little bit of contact as well. And that means that we're going to have Kevin Lallis Jr. losing himself a little bit of time. Um, but Marcus Jensen loses out the most. Replay of that one going to come up for you now. Uh, and these two drivers came together in towards that first corner. I'm going to stop the tape here. That's where the contact happened there, Johnny. And it was just, a, I think there, that that burst esports car was just moving a little bit too close uh, because Ellis Jr. didn't have much. And yes, you do run the curbs here, but you've got to give at least a car width. Yeah, I mean, look, Ellis Jr. came in a little bit hot and Jensen maybe turned in slightly early, but uh, two guys there trying to fight for the same piece of racetrack, basically. They both needed to stay wide and Ellis needed to stay tighter. Uh, hard one to judge there by the looks of it, but uh, contact regardless and hopefully minimal damage that doesn't affect their races. For Jensen, it's the last thing that he needed. His teammate has race-winning pace and Jensen, who qualified so well on that second row, is falling down the order. He's only in P8 at the moment, so a long way to go. Uh, that pit stop window opens next lap round on lap 13. That will be for your three stop runners, but I don't think uh, we'll see anybody come in as early as lap 13. It'll be very early. The realistic time to stop, like we discussed early on in the race, is uh, lap 16 onwards for that first of the three stops. But uh, yeah, it's lap 13 will be quite early. We'll see if anybody wants to get out of traffic. I will say that having had a look at it from another angle, it did look as though that Ellis Jr. did dive that into the inside of Tamburello chicane and then just kind of didn't really attack the apex of the corner. That's what caused them to push wide. And having a look from up above, of course, you can always say, yeah, you've got yourself one lane, two lanes, three lanes, four, but it doesn't really work when you go into the apex of the corner and you didn't just start to go straight when you really need to be turning hard to left. So racing incident, I would argue there, of course, there are stewards that will have a look at incidents after the event here in all World Championship Series events. So thank you to those guys that do work towards the Aries and community. But out front, the gap between Peter Berriman and Martin Kronke. It looks as though that Kronke is just losing a little bit every single lap, but Kronke at the same time could just be preserving a little bit of tire life right now. They come past the start finish line again, onto lap number 13, and Kronke that time by loses a tenth of a second. I will say, Jake, in the back of my head, we've got ourselves an Apex Racing UK machine leading. I'm thinking back to Monza. You are thinking back to Monza and what that could do is here comes Michael Partington down the inside of Yao Vaz and he's going to pick up a position there, moves himself up into 11th, having started the day in 17th place. So he's now plus six. Now look at Yao Vaz under pressure from Earthguard, not going to get the move down into Villeneuve. But you are right, you start thinking about Monza here for Peter Berryman and you start thinking about how he hasn't got that race victory so far this year. He has thrown away opportunities and we have talked about what's happened after the pit stops so for Berryman I think it's good right now that he's in the lead he's got himself that gap of one and a half seconds but he can't rest on his laurels will he has to keep on going yeah and the gap between Martin Kronke and Mitchell De Jong has gone up as De Jong has got himself ahead of Josh Rogers and that's happened in the last lap or so as well so Johnny um, we've got De Jong now up into third place as Hootie's now going to have a look actually in towards Ravatsa, not able to do so. But actually, let's stay on board of Hootie because this will really see the straight line speed difference between Redline and um, Burst Esports. And you can just see Burst Esports still have themselves DRS range 
to Koan in front of them. But as a consequence of that, it means that Hutu is losing massive amounts of time. I think there's about four car lengths um, in towards one. And what the drivers do is they set up these cars, at least the Burst Esports uh, team has set up these cars to deploy a lot of ERS on that main straight, all the way leading up to the Tamburello, the first real braking zone of the circuit. And they're so quick around there, it's perfect. So Rogers again, this is a bit of time there through Villeneuve, through turn seven here. Hutu starts to gain back a little bit of that time. I, I have to say as well, looking at the pace so far, this looks like a two-stop race. The drivers haven't lost that much time. They've only lost about a second from their early laps early on in the event. But Peter Berryman so far, he has race-winning pace. Out of all this grid right now, Peter Berryman has been the best driver so far. The only bad thing he's done all race was turn number one, lap one. Yeah, he has lost about four tenths per second though um, so three tenths on that last lap and he's lost himself a little bit on this one as well we're back on board with martin Cronkate, second place number five vos command and sim sports car out of the to number two towards the start finish line there used to be a really hard chicane at the end of this lap no longer in terms of the world championship series and Cronkate that time by lost a bit of time again so a mistake for Barryman on that previous lap Cost him a little bit, but he's starting to build up that pace once again. Behind, we have got Ricardo Orozco, Jake. He's battling out with Antoine Peglin, beating the nine. We've also then got a battle going on. Argentine Yalvaz and Tommy Urskard. Yes, we do, as David Williams gets himself a good defence then against Davy de Corps, the Frenchman in the Orion racing machine. And, well, he's done well to hold that one off there as David Williams he goes through. Great scrapping that mid-pack as well. They're sort of caught in this DRS train a little bit here, Will, where erskard has got the DRS on Yao Vaz, who's got the DRS just, and I think he's falling away from it now, from Michael Partington. Partington desperately trying to cling on to a Roscoe, who maybe doesn't have enough to get to Antoine Higelin. Great scrapping in the mid pack right now and I will say though Berryman has been the more inconsistent so far this race Kronke has been metronomic best yeah but for Kronke in the case it's going to be he's actually now back in one second so he should get DRS this time by if you can just hold it through back to number two let's have a look from the rear wing then and let's see is that flap going to deploy then yes it will do for uh, Martin Kronke so he has now got DRS and once you're in that one second range you can start gaining time a little bit quicker I say that he lost himself half a turn to a second with DRS enabled then <laughs> it could have been saving a bit of the ERS you never know and remember they made that mistake at Watkins Glen and Dion lost the lead and lost the race win to Hutu on the final lap of that race only a few corners to go and straight after the race De Jong said I know our issue I'm going to fix it and talking to a lot of teams they said oh this must have been the way that they deployed ERS around the track because that's the only way you'd know it that quickly so uh, Kawanda's keeping their lips shut on that matter but again hopefully they haven't made that mistake for Umala uh, but so far anyway only four laps until we'll see the first of the drivers electing for that two stop surely there's a driver out there Will who wants to gamble for the one stop the you remember Mike Del Orco? Is... We want Mike Del Orco back in this type of championship. <laughs> you know, let's have someone try and do a full stop and see where it takes you. Because, I mean, nah. Mike Del Orco was fantastic to uh, see him go off strategy so much, right? Yeah, no, it was. But I think with the <laughs> iRacing, of, the, the funny thing is, and this is something we're seeing in Formula 1 as well in the real world, iRacing are like, yeah, these tyres are going to degrade so much when a three, three four-stop races, much like Pirelli say, and then the drivers figure out and, and the teams figure out a way to save the tires so well that they're only stopping once or twice in the end event. So the degradation might need to improve for 2019. Uh, regardless of that though, the pace, if you look at it, Kronke, 1 minute 22.2 last time round, a low 22 at this stage. If you pit for fresh rubber, you might be in the low 21. So a second gain at this stage is is not that dramatic of an influence. We could be seeing a one-stop race if this pace remains this way. And I think the consequence of that will be because it is only one second. Of course, Jake, this is only a one minute, 22 second lap around here. So um, it's a shorter track and a higher speed track than what we see at other places. The issue for me, two stop to one stop, isn't actually the amount of time you gain through the tire life. It's the pit stop um, itself. And the fact that you are flat out now from the exit of Raptor 2 until the Tamborella came, and that's a very long piece of track. 
be going at a slow speed on pits. But it's a very slow pit road as well, which makes it very difficult. And I think that these drivers at the front are waiting for a gap because Mogar Filio in 20th position is currently 35 seconds off of the race lead at the moment. That's what Berryman's looking for, a gap to try and exploit and come down in onto pit road. Will he dive this time by? You're leading to decide to stay out here on lap 17. On lap 17, third stays out, fourth stays out, fifth stays out. Keep an eye on Gregor Hutu, though. He had a little look last lap as well, Will. Looking into Villeneuve, he wasn't close enough to make that charge. And again, Will, not close enough yet in towards turn number one, but he's within four tenths of a second. He has a chance with a great run, with a great downforce we know Redline has. He's very close right now. He's, uh, I don't think he can pull off a move into Vilna for sure. But again, Hutu now has to get this next right-hander correct. He does. Rogers have run right there quite a number of times. We'll keep an eye on that. And then Hutu slams on the brakes through seven. The one thing we used to do, Will, to figure out tire life was... And now I might be giving away. I don't know if this is... This is either the best idea you'll hear or one of the worst is... We used to hot lap at different fuel loads. So there'll be like six or seven different markers we set from qualifying fuel load to, to, to uh, what do you call it again? Uh, full fuel, max fuel. I'm having a brain lapse with the word. Um, and what we used to do was the delta time, we'd, we'd use that delta time to see, okay, if we pit for a fresh set of rubber at this time, how quick would we be? Hutu though, struggling with wear at the moment, may need that delta. The tires are starting to drop off for all the drivers here. Hutu, uh, Berryman and Kronke seem good, but the rest of the field starting to struggle. Yeah, and I'll tell you one thing. Now it comes down to who can be the best on old tires. And this is where Hutu and Kronke both shine as Kronke has closed that gap now down to four attempts per second over Peter Berryman. Um, we're going to, of course, talk about this lead battle, Jake. But in terms of trying to find things to do apart from watching the World Cup and watching the RAs and World Championship Grand Prix Series, I currently have a significant other watching Midsummer Murders. Wow, so that's um, oh, different, man. but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you credit for that. Kronke brings the gap down, though. It's half a second out on track. It's the closest it's been since about lap number 1.25. And I think for Martin Kronke, he knows now. He's starting to do the Gregor Hutu thing. Great in laps, looking for the great outlap and the great pit stop as well. It's one of the marks of a great champion. Maximize your stoppages as much as possible. And for now, Martin Martin Conquet knows he's got to apply that pressure on Peter Berryman. And Berryman knows that he's not going to get a win for free in this series. Martin Conquet means business. He wants to become the first driver this season to get back-to-back -back victories. Yeah, as it stands right now, the gap is seven tenths of a second. Closing out lap number 19 of 62 here on the iRacing Esports Network, Racebot TV. As Conquet yeah, there did just lose himself about two tenths of a second. Um, as he exited um, the Ravazza, just he couldn't get that car under power. And those are just little things that we're talking about here, Johnny. As the fuel load goes down, here comes and the Gregor. tire goes up, as we've got Gregor Hutu. Oh. Close to make a move, didn't make it. Hutu is close there to, to Rogers. He's been looming behind Rogers' back for quite a while. One thing I have to say is, uh, Kronke and Hutu are the most impressive at saving their tyres, and they are two of the best, aren't they, Will? Of course. Why I'm so impressed with Peter Berryman is that he's actually in that top three in this race in terms of conserving his tyres. He looks very good. Lap traffic gets out of the way. That's Mo Garfilio. I got very nervous there. When Jake started talking, I said, oh, did Filio crash or something, the lap car? Uh, lucky he didn't interrupt that lead battle. Yeah, as we're having a look then down in towards Aquaminerati for these drivers. P number four, P number five, Rogers, of course started towards the front of the field and has lost himself a position. He's doing a better job there than his first esports teammate as they work themselves over his high clubs once again. Because his teammate is all the way down on team number eight. And Marcus Jensen, not for the first time this season here, Jake, is struggling when those tyres start to fall off a little bit. Well, that's been his one Horcrux that he needs to try and get through. And, well, 
for the moment. It's going to be a case of when can I find a way to get the pace back. Keep an eye on Hutu again. He's within a very few couple of tenths of a second, but we've seen how he struggled to pull that gap in, and he pulls it down again and again, and he gets within a tenth of a second, but then he hits the breaking zone here for turn number one and two and three, and he's just been unable to make anything work as Team Orders comes into play as Kevin Ellis Jr. finds his way past Jamie Fluke behind. Yeah, that's interesting. It's so early on there for Apex Racing UK, but it might well be, Jake, because of the fact that there's such a narrow set of windows here when it comes to um, the pit stop. You want to get it done early rather than waiting for pit stops to pan out. Exactly, and you have to remember it's also a narrow pit road as well. You don't want to be stuck behind someone who's going to be slow breaking onto that lane because legitimately you just peel off dead straight right and you're into pit road very very quickly so you've got to make sure that you've got enough room as well will to really try and attack that pit road if you can't attack it you're losing time yeah and earlier on Johnny, you talked about it being maybe a second mm. to a second and a half in terms of the only cup well of course we did forget to account for the fact that it is beaming down with sun right now on this racetrack and that means yeah. the undercuts closer to two seconds yeah, if you laid some food on the tarmac, you may cook it faster than you're at your local grill. It's that, it's that hot out there, 43 degree track temp. We've had these temperatures all season, very hot track temperatures. Uh, ambient, only 26 degrees, clear skies as well. But the one thing is, looking at the lap, and lap times and the pace at the moment as that two-stop window is in, Berryman makes throw. a mistake, oh. by the way. And uh, he just said... Oh! Hootie's gone off down at the Tamarillo chicane. Replay coming up for you now. Sorry to interrupt you there, Johnny, but it looked as though that was going to be a picture-perfect move there by Gregor Hootie in towards Tamarillo. We stay on board of him. Let's have a look on board of him first. Anticart launches him into the air. More rake is better. Ouch, Gregor. You don't often get that horribly of, of an incident, but for Gregor Hutu, he just strays over the anti-cut curb a little bit too aggressive on his move around the outside of Josh Rogers. What's that cost him, Will? It's cost him Jamie Fluke. It's cost him Kevin Ellis Jr. And right now, it's costing him a lot of points in his championship. Yeah, so Gregor Hutu then falls down into P number seven. We don't know what damage there is. Also, Johnny, to the underside of that race car. Yeah, you don't know as well. Luckily, the front wing is fine. So we'll find that during the pit stop, which will be coming shortly. This is going to be a one-stop race at this stage. These drivers are comfortable, but the undercut is two seconds. Now, here's the dilemma. Where is the clear track for the leaders? Kronke is in prime position to take the lead of this race. He has to do the opposite to Berryman. That's all that Martin Kronke needs to do. And right now, I think uh, Berryman is in no man's land. He needs to cover off Martin, but... Uh, man, there is no clear track for him behind. The engineers have their work cut out for him at this stage. There is a bit of clear track, because let's go and have a look right now at the driver of Balas Remniak. He is 36 seconds behind your overall race leader. The thing is, though, there is a 10-second gap between Balas Remniak and David Williams, who, of course, the commander, is a friendly teammate. So, you pit it right now. You'd come out behind Balas Remniak, but, Jay, with a two-second um, over speed through to fresher tyres plus the difference in terms of these cars well the car the drivers being faster than another you would argue that actually right now is the perfect time to pit yes you might struggle with tyre life later on but of course later on the race you have less fuel on board and that should make the circumstance a little bit better better well we even. know Yes, we certainly do see that. And, well, you also have to remember there's about a 14-second gap back to Dion Verges. So if they don't even put Bayer's Remnick in the window, there is still a window behind. Any takers for any takers? No, they still stay out. But Kronke still clawing that gap down then against Peter Berman. Was at half a second. Now it drops under for the first time at four tenths of a second. So Kronke is starting to reel in the very man who can and maybe cannot stop here, Martin Kronke. So for the moment, that's a little bit concerning at the moment as still nobody decides that the pit road is their friend. I'll tell you one thing here, Johnny. Knowing the fact that there is that gap on track, I would say if Gronke doesn't come in and, and you're Mitchell de Jong, you should come in right now because within two, three laps, that puts you back in the hunt for the race lead. And I do not understand why Koana haven't tried to put one of their drivers into this gap that right now clearly does exist. Well, when Coanda aren't battling with each other, 
and when they're trying to work together or if they're trying to get past another driver, they'll be pitting on the same lap. That's the trend that we've seen. Kronke and Dion will probably most likely be coming in at the same time. Anton Hegelin's entered the pit lane, as we know. It's a 34-second pit delta here at Imola, and Berryman is struggling. This race could be gone here at the Ravazza curse for Peter Berryman, but I think he may be able to keep this position. Kronke is smart enough to not pull off a kamikaze move into this downhill braking zone. But of course, that gap between, like you said, Peter Belazaz Remenyuk, it is there for Martin Kronke to take. He's not taking it so far. It is very early, I have to say, Will, for the one stop anyway. Yeah, it is a little bit on the early side. Also worth noting, of course, that if you can force your opponent into a mistake, that makes your situation a lot easier as well. Alex Jr. Here um, he comes. Look at Ellis Jr. He's going to attack Josh Rogers. Is he? No, he's not. He's just on the outside, unable to make that move. And Will, Josh Rogers is really fading. Look, he's struggling out of Tamborello. Here comes Ellis Jr. with maybe a chance at Villeneuve. Yeah, having a look from the rear then of oh, Rogers. It can be really hard, though, to make a move down at the Villeneuve chicane. Rogers does get two wheels onto the dirty stuff as they come now down into Tosa. Uphill. Very long corner. And this is where. You've got to start thinking about risks, though, as we've got ourselves David Williams out of this event. Replay for what happened to him now. In towards... Oh, wow! We saw that in FP3 in the Grand Prix with when you've got your DRS lap wide open, Johnny, you can potentially have no downforce on that car at all. And that's exactly what happened to David Williams. That DRS lap was wide open for him um, as he comes down in towards turn number one. Mm. And he just loses it. I, I've never seen that ever. That that like I've seen drivers steer with DRS and lose the car, but to, he hardly even moved left. That's what was so weird with that accident. He just he was a sitting duck. So something's wrong there for David Williams. I'm surprised he didn't find that out in testing or something, because that's something with the setup that you'll uh, know early on. And the the thing is, has he, he hasn't made a pit stop either. So maybe he's never tested that with worn tires. That's how sensitive these worn tires are. Some of these drivers now electing to one stop this race. We could see a lot of drivers going off the racetrack. We're already seeing Josh Rogers doing it every lap at Villeneuve. Ooh, we could see it even more. Alice Jr. got very close there into the Tamborello chicane. Up the hill, they work themselves once again. Let's give you a little bit of race spot TV fan immersion. Let's go on board then with Kevin Ellis Jr. in the number 98 Apex Racing UK machine. Ellis Jr. then is up into fourth place. You saw it live. And of course, you can keep up to date with live timing and scoring by visiting racemore.tv forward slash timing. This production of the Iris and World Championship Grand Prix Series on the Iris and Esports Network brought to you by Racebot TV. Gronke, second place, hunting down Peter Barrowman over the curves again, Jake over the curbs again but Mitchell De Jong is the fastest man of the three over the last two laps 122.6 the last time by for De Jong 22.9 for Kronke 22.7 for Peter Berryman they're worrying now they're bringing De Jong back into this race here by running the strategy because De Jong has been the most conservative on the tyres here comes Jamie Fluke though around the outside of Josh Rogers on the run to Ravazza and it's a bit of contact round goes Jamie Fluke and now that's going to cause the train to scatter and Rogers to the back as is Jamie Fluke in comes Kevin Ellis Jr. to make his first stop. Perfect timing maybe there for Alex Jr. knowing his opponents have all got themselves into issues. 
Here we are then. A look down in towards Ravazza. You've got Rogers and you've got Fluke in through Ravazza 1. And it looks as though that that Burst Esports car just had absolutely no grip at all. If your name is um, Rogers. Let's have a look again on board of him. As we work ourselves down towards Ravazza. I'd love your view on this one here, Johnny. As they come down into the corner. You see, he holds that inside line. Does he clip the curb? He doesn't clip the curb, but he just has no grip there with that left tire on the white line. Yeah, I, I'm not, not going to judge on that. The, the, good, the, the good point is, is that it was a quick pit stop for him, and he did have a slight bit of damage. That's all repaired. He's just behind Tommy Oscar, though. Tommy Oscar's made a pit stop. Tommy Oscar has undercutted joshua rogers here now the problem is tommy oscar is probably two stopping this race which is a different story but right now that's the that's the pit delta time i think looking at the pace right now of peter berryman your leader it is two seconds to two and a half seconds quicker if you pit for fresh tires now berryman comes in Cronke continues i think berryman will sustain the lead but Cronke doing the opposite exactly what he needed to do so here then is the driver of peter berryman making his first and potentially only pit stop of the day as we get close to halfway distance here. And I'm surprised that Kronke did not come in on the same lap unless he's got something left in his tyres. But here then is Berman into his stall. Four seconds out and away for the Apex Racing UK machine as he'll come back out onto track. It's going to be very interesting. Will it be in any form of traffic? More drivers pitting. Marcus Jensen, Alvaz, Michael Partington, Ricardo Orozco. And for Berriman, clear track, front and back, Jake. Front and back, and exactly what's needed is Partington and Orozco almost side by side coming out of pit road. They're nose to tail now as they come out of the lane. And look at how quickly you need to get up to speed. Here comes Josh Rogers around the outside of Tommy Erskard, and he makes that look plain sailing on the fresh rubber as Erskard has nothing left in the tank. Out comes Partington, and there's Antoine Higelan trying to get through, but he's not going to be able to do so. And now here will come Ricardo Orozco here looking to attack Higelan, who is now on the older tyres. I'll tell you one thing, Jake. If you're Ricardo Orozco, be pretty peeved after that. Gets caught out of once, and look at that on the round the outside of Vilna. Nice. That is going to be on to one Hanglin. Pass of the day. Wonderful. And just make the through. Partington almost sliced into him at Tosa. Oh, what a spectacular move, of course, as well. On the back foot was Mike Partington and then Ricardo Orozco behind. Uh, this race is, we've been too focused on strategies. It's good to see some more on track action like that. Fantastic pass there. But um, to go back to my previous point there, Jake, if your name is Ricardo Orozco, you must have been a little bit angry coming out of pit road, knowing that the fact that you had to wait patiently in line literally cost you a position. In fact, now two as the cause on pit road. Yeah, David Accor then hits the lane. You can see behind Marcus Jensen is hungry to get positions. You can see how much Jensen has lost in all of this. He oh needs to get past the whole lot as well. And yes, there's Partington running wide. And it is an oh my word for how much he's gone behind. Worth noting, Kronke and De Jong both stayed out. And De Jong now is within a second of Martin Kronke. They're going to go for the overcut wheel here on this strategy. Get themselves two, three laps fresher rubber. And then look to chase down Peter Berryman later on. De Jong run, runs wide, though, through the first part of the chicane. But my goodness, you have to look five, six directions here to know what's going on. Yeah, I want to go back here. We're having a look at Ilka Hapala. This is him coming in towards Pit Road in the Orion Race Team number eight. He comes in. One, two three four realize he's overshot realize he's overshot again he overshot he lost six seconds there on pit road on top of what his actual pit stop time was as here is then Mitchell de Jong on track and Kronke on towards pit road so Martin Kronke making his pit stop then at the end of lap number 30 He's going to do his stop, and it's going to be a stop of 4.2 seconds. In comparison to Berman, it is two turns per second slower. But that's all down to tyres, etc. Um, Hutu on pit road as well. He's going to make his service, and he's out in four seconds as well. Franke back onto track, and the gap between himself and Peter Berman is up now to 4.2 seconds. That's a lot to pour back in the second part of this event here, Johnny. We've seen it happen, but it can be very tough. Yeah, Kronke has to make the pass for the win on track. Who knows if De Jong now on fresher rubber will put his name 
into the picture for a race victory. But of course, it is a 34, 35 second pit lane delta time here. So Kronke should have De Jong covered, especially on the fresher rubber anyway. Uh, De Jong should definitely come in this time around. I mean, it's halfway through the race. It's easier to manage the tires on lower fuel. You should always pit before the 50% distance mark. De Jong does exactly that. And try something different, does Mitchell De Jong. Probably went a lap longer, because I always do see those Coanda drivers pit on the same lap. Uh, not this time around. The De Jong is onto a pit road. The Red Bull helmet there, of course, for De Jong, representing the Radicoff work he's been doing in America over the past couple of years, of course. We won't talk about some of what's happened this year. 4.3, though, from Mitchell De Jong. Out and away he comes. Now, where is he going to feed him to this? He's got a long, long way. It's a lonely road down on pit road at 37 miles an hour. Now you pick up the pace. And if your name is Mitchell De Jong, you're going to come out in third place on track. And you're going to be ahead of Kevin Ellis Jr. I want to talk quickly about who to there, um, Jake. Of course, he did have the incident earlier on. But he's only in P number six. One mistake at Imola will always cost you. It always will, but for Gregor Hutu, he knows that he's got Josh Rogers in front, who's on older tyres. He can start pushing. Kevin Ellis Jr. on older tyres as well. He won't be able to get the advantage, though, on De Jong, Kronke and Berryman, and he got held up in the early stages. That's what's going to cost him. He needs a little bit of help now from these drivers, De Jong, Kronke, Berryman. He needs them to run into each other now for a little bit of hope in the points, but right now, Kronke needs to show, uh, get some words out, Jake, chase down Berryman, and right now, De Jong knows that he's got one lap fresh rubber. He's got to do everything to close down the two, three seconds that he's lost to Kronke in the stops. Yeah, so let's have a look at your top eight down here in the Iris World Championship Grand Prix Series. It is Peter Berman who is leading the way over Martin Kronke by 3.8 seconds as it stands right now. Not the 154 that you see in the screen. That will update itself in just a couple of seconds time. The gap is 3.7 seconds they come past the start finish line. Mitchell De Jong in third place there with Kevin Ellis Jr. in fourth. So you've got two Apex drivers and two Commander drivers inside your top four. First eSports, Joshua Rogers in P number five. Gregor Hutu for Team Redline in sixth. Jamie Fluke and Tommy Ersgaard round out your top eight. We will take a quick break here on Racebot TV and on iRacing Live. We'll be about two and a half minutes. Don't go anywhere. We'll take your Racebot TV side by side. So, you want to race in NASCAR. The road starts here. Introducing the eNASCAR at Night Series powered by iRacing. This is the gateway for all aspiring 13 to 16 year olds. Starting June 20th, ignite your dreams of one day racing in the top tiers of NASCAR. Go to www.iracing.com slash ignite for full details. So what are you afraid of? Those feelings are made of. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. Four more time, kilometers. Oh, there we go! Right. They time. caught! This time, like the last time, I'm moving so fast, I'm ready to run. Cronky! Down to the inside, and here she's off! Ossinger throws the block, and he will keep him behind him. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Lower the lights down. Hand over my crown. Hand over my heart. I do this for my town. I do this for my crown. So turn me up real loud. My time.
the iRacing Esports Network. Catch the best moment, the best racing from series on Racebot TV, LSR TV, and V8 Online, including all six iRacing World Championship Series. You've got the NASCAR Pit Entry Series, powered by iRacing, the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series, the VRS the GT Series. We've got ourselves two fantastic series on dirt, and of course, also the iRacing Rallycross Series. So subscribe to us on YouTube, the iRacing Esports Network. Battle is going up on track, and we did see Mark Parkinson move himself up, Jake, into P number nine, moving past Antoine Heglin. However, Heglin is on eight lap older tyres. He is, and we've also seen Gregor Hutu go through or just on this lap on Josh Rogers. That was into turn number one around the outside. He got it slowed down. He didn't go uh, and curb hop over Tamburello, but he's done very, very well to get himself into position. And look at how he's starting to pull away now. Next up, Kevin Ellis Jr., and he's down the road a good six seconds. So he's got a good 20 laps worth of work here. He wants to close down. Gap at the front now, down to 3.2, Will. Yeah, we did talk about this, that Hutu will kind of find himself past without too much difficulty over the driver of Joshua Rogers. Um, he's pulled out a one second advantage almost already. The thing is though, Hutu is 6.5 seconds, Johnny, behind um, Kevin Ellis Jr. right now. And then a further three seconds back from Mitchell De Jong. So realistically now, Hutu is running for fourth unless people around him have issues. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. He's going to reel in Kevin Ellis Jr. soon. He's got the fresher rubber. One lap fresher rubber will make all the difference. Because at the moment, it looks like Martin will reel in Berryman in front. De Jong's going to reel in Kronke in front. Now, if that's not the recipe for an interesting finish, then I don't know what is. So whether or not the Coanda cars can get fast. Now, some inside information from... From a couple of drivers I've been, I've been speaking to during the middle of this race is that they can see Coanda is on the medium downforce where teams such as Apex have gone for the low downforce, maybe even Burst Esport too. And so that's going to make the overtake all that more difficult for those Coanda cars. And you know, whether or not Kronke can get it done is, uh, is a big question. He's a two-time world champion, of course. We don't have to keep reminding everybody about that, Will, but the strategy is in his hands at the moment. It's the overtake that's the other question. Yeah. Um, we've just been having a look at a battle between Michael Parsonson and Antoine Hegelin. Um, and there's also Marcus Jensen here. Marcus Jensen really has struggled in this race here. He's down into P number 10. Uh, I mean, for many people, we have to say, Jake, that a uh, 10th place in the Irish World Championship Grand Prix Series is an accomplishment in itself. It's something that, you know, only, uh, I think, less than 100 drivers have ever done. You've already made that 50 drivers, to be honest. However, um, you've got yourself, as it stands, Partington and Hegelin separated by 7 tenths of a second, and then Hegelin and Marcus Jensen separated by 6.5 tenths of a second. We get those last laps as well. It was a 121.8 for Michael Partington. He was the fastest man of the train because he got 22 flat there for Marcus Jensen. In fact, I'm going to correct myself because there was a 21.4 coming in from Ricardo Orozco, 21.7 from Yao Vaz. They're catching this train, and Ricardo Orozco has now got to run the gauntlet, find a way through all these three drivers. But as we're seeing, DRS train comes into effect. It becomes incredibly difficult to make the move. And right now, the cork in the bottle, Antoine Higelin, is not going to give up a move for anybody. We know how hard Higelin loves to fight the Frenchman. Yeah, for Orozco and for Jensen and Partington, they are on pressure tyres and Erskine and Heglin. And that is going to be the thing here, Johnny. In that mid-pack, the difference between the one-stop and the two-stop is I think the drivers now, because they've been able to hold on that one-stop, they will get themselves a bit of an advantage if they can find their way past. And look how close it is right now between the likes of Marcus Jensen and Antoine Heglin in towards turn number one. Jensen has himself that DRS flat wide open, but Marcus Jensen says, you know what? I've got one too. And he dies down to the inside into Tamburello. Well, he screamed down the inside. He picked so late, Marcus Jensen, and he's on the inside and tied the line. Higlin, who's actually a great overtaker, and he's got great racecraft. Uh, not his best showing there, of course, in terms of defense, but uh, Higlin's had better days, of course. We saw him pull off overtaking a season almost early on in this event. Uh, but Jensen's a quicker driver. If he settled into that, that rhythm that he, he hasn't found all race, well, better late than never. He's got a lot of positions to make up, of course. And then... Uh, this race is um, it's as exciting as we predicted, and I want to see more of it here. 
Yeah, as we've seen, got Ricardo Orozco there in the positive sim racing machine, hunting down Antoine Hedlem as they go at it for P number 11 on track. Ricardo Orozco is the slightly older tyres than Jensen, um, and in fact, yeah, and then Marcus Jensen by a lap, but he is still on that kind of one-stop strategy right now. You want to keep an eye out, though, on the likes of um, Stephen Michaels, um, who might be catching up the career of Daniel Port over time. We do have to like, go back to your race lead right now here, Jake, because you've got yourself a battle going on between Peter Berriman and Martin Cronke, and the gap, the early advantage that you get on the newer tyres, they are coming to fruition, because over the last three laps, Martin Cronke has been 1.3 seconds faster, 1.4 even, over Peter Berriman. The gap is now 1.7. And on that last lap, Berryman was a little bit held up by Ryan Race Team's Dion Vergers. Not much he could do there. He maybe could have gone Banzai at uh, Ravatta, but there really wasn't an opportunity. And it's a similar gap here again between Cronke and Vergers. And you know you get yellow helmet syndrome when Martin Cronke is right behind you in your mirrors. And just like that, he goes straight through. Rest in peace, Ayrton Senna. But for now, that means that Martin Cronke gets easier luck with the traffic. He's now got himself the opportunity and let's not forget here about Mitchell De Jong. He's still closing down that gap quicker than Martin Cronke. Three tenths every single lap. He's brought the gap down to about 2.3 seconds right now. He's still there. Yeah, but he had a horrible last lap. And what he did is he actually lost himself four tenths per second. Now, part of that was dealing with the traffic. But, Johnny, he also did go wide at Revacta 1. You do have to be patient, though. See, that's the kind of stuff you can't let go in your head. You made one mistake, one corner's all right. You know, I always speak about it, and I, I contradict myself, and and I say, oh, you know, he's made a mistake. You can see that he's off rhythm, but sometimes if you're mentally strong, you, you forget about it, you know? Martin's in a good stage in this race. He's in a good uh, good strategy at the moment. De Jong as well, hunting him down's in a good... Uh, he's got a good end to this race for him, and as I said, it's just the overtake they have to pull off in the medium downforce car, which I'm assuming they've set up... Um, as so far. Yeah, you got two wheels onto the gravel there, did Martin Kronke, that's what cost him a little bit of time. But the thing is though, Johnny, we talk about, yeah, okay, you lost a little bit like last lap, you've got to keep yourself calm and focused. When you're on fresher tyres and a one-stop strategy, you don't have the time to, okay, just get back into focus <laughs> because that four tenths of a second, I guarantee it can come back and haunt you at the end of the race. No, exactly, you're right, you know. Uh, we'll see what happens anyway. I think Kronke will probably catch Berryman and he'll sort of, it'll be like a roadblock. He just can't make his way past. It's been, it's like, it's been such an interesting race with these strategies because it's such a long pit lane. You lose, as I said, 35 seconds in the Delta time. Other tracks we see 25 seconds sometimes, which is why you might see the two or three stops. But this race, you know, one stop ability or, or the, the lack thereof of overtaking, which we've seen over the years, the drivers have said, yeah, we've got to one-stop this, you know, and um, it's been a, it's still been an entertaining race so far as we see position swap between uh, one of the drivers, Tommy Oscar, actually enters the pit lane, he's on the two-stop, and he's going to file down the order, and you can see why, Will, you lose over a minute in the pit lane this race, two-stopping, there's no point to it. Yeah, we did talk about, well, we were about to talk about that one, Jake, about Tommy Erskine, because he was coming under pressure there from Partington, makes his second pit stop, um, and now he will have fresh tyres at the end of this event. So he can gain time back up, but he's got to hope that the drop-off of drivers around him is substantial enough that he doesn't get held up too much by traffic, especially where he's coming out in P number 15. He's got clean air, which is useful for him. But when he gets to Ilka Hapala, Stephen Michaels, David Accor, over time, he's got to hope that their tyres have literally fallen off a cliff. You look at Gregor Hutu, for example, he's running the fastest laps of his event. He has, since lap 34, been either a 121 flat or a 121.1. Talk about tyre drop-off. What is tyre drop-off, Gregor Hutu? He does not even know the name of tyre drop-off. So that's the sort of thing that Erskard's up against. Drivers who are not really seeing that drop-off. Ricardo Orozco, for example, fastest lap of his day so far was set on the last lap, 121.395. It's not working for Tommy Oscar. He's clearly on on the wrong strategy. Yeah, of course so. For Gregor Hutu, Jake, because he did have a seven second advantage as Jensen and Partington are going at it in towards turn number one. Um, you've got to consider the fact though, for the driver of Gregor Hutu, because of the fact that he's having to gain um, a seven second to get to Ellis Jr. and beyond, he's pushing right now. And this is Hutu at his best. 
when he can just basically run hot laps and go on clear track. He's probably the best sim racer that we've ever seen, not only in terms of iRacing, but over the course of the last 20 years. But who to them has to find a way past Ellis Jr. and the Yacht if he wants a podium, both who are likely to be on slightly different aero packages today. Exactly, and I'm not sure he's even going to get to Dion because Dion's going quicker than him. 120.993, the only man on that last lap to be in the 120 range. And I'm pretty sure that Mitchell Dion also holds the fastest lap of this event today on a 120.824 set on lap 38 of this event. That time, a 21-1 for Mitchell Dion. Closes two tenths on Martin Cronke, who he himself closes two tenths on Peter Berryman with two bits of lap trapping in front. There's Moritz Lona, Team 33, moving out of the way. And then Paul Ilbrink, the gentleman that he is in the Radicals Online team, he'll get out of the way, no doubt. But right now, it is the traffic game that's starting to hurt Berryman. Well, we did say earlier on, Johnny, in fact, there's 26 drivers in this field here today. We'll make it easier for your leaders when it comes up to traffic compared to a full field. Not by much, but by a little bit. And every car always matters. But now, Kronke, if he's lucky, he'll catch this traffic on the exit of the chicane before he gets into a Vactor, but I don't think he's going to do so. It's very distracting, though, this traffic, isn't it? Look at Berryman trying to get a bit of a toe on the run to the Berriante Alta. Oh, goodness. What is going to happen here on the exit? Kronke doesn't lose too much time. And the lap cars get out of the way. This is why you need to pick brake markers, Will, that aren't sentient. You want to pick brake markers that are static, like, you know, a color on the wall or something at different points. You don't want to pick a shadow because the time of the day will change at different points. And iRacing uh, simulate that very well, of course, too. And you want to pick a brake marker that drivers aren't going to knock off every lap. I had a race once. Remember, I rode America, Will. Yeah. They have those cones. And I was in a sim once where the cones were removed and all four of us in the top four all missed the corner at the exact same time. Um, that was pretty hilarious. I was so happy because I was the only one who didn't hit the wall. I'll tell you one thing. Um, Homestead Miami Speedway has probably got the hardest per entry of any oval because um, you've got to run the inside line all the way through turn number three and four. But there is a palm tree which became my break mark when no. I used to run in the iRacing <laughs> in IndyCar series and it would work perfectly. You know that basically you hit that palm tree, you break your turn and everything will be okay. Um, Antoine Hedlin uh, is out of the event, just to let you know, he's out of the event as a two laps have gone. He has fallen down our time and scrolls. We'll try and get you an update on this one. Here are your top eight then, as oh. it stands. What's going on, Jake? I just had a look at that Higelan incident. He ran straight into Erskard into turn number one, and it was a horrible, horrible bit of contact, Will. It was one which just completely stopped both vehicles, and that is Higelan out and probably broken suspension the course. Yeah, so we will try and find that one for you after the event. Um, as Peter Berriman leading the way, 1.3 seconds over Martin Cronkay. Mitchell de Jong in third place, but catching Cronkay as Cronkay catches Berriman. Ellis Jr. in fourth place. He's kind of static there in fourth. He's got Hutu behind him, but it's still 3.2 between Ellis Jr. and Hutu. Rogers in P number six. Luke in seventh. Parsons in eighth place. Ninth is Marcus Jensen. And then Ricardo Orozco, who are riding on board with, rounds out your top ten. You can get social with us here, ladies and gentlemen. Forward slash Racebook TV at Racebook TV on Twitter. If you want to get in contact with us, you can ask us anything quite often on Facebook. Had a couple of really interesting ones as Partington and Jensen go side by side in towards turn number one. And Michael Partington is going to be the beneficiary of that one. We'll get ourselves a second look there. Johnny, it did look like very, very easy for Partington when all was said and done. Yeah, it did. I think you actually Partington was ahead. He was ahead, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I take that back. Um, he was yeah. under pressure towards turn number one. But yeah, nothing there that Jensen could do. Yeah, their names did switch on the timing screens. That always gets me excited. Eyebrows raised with that. And uh, Jensen, though, still behind, trying to search his way past. Very underrated race from Michael Partington. It's in P8. There's a guy who, um, he shouldn't be in the World Championship, remember, Will? Yeah. He only got this license because Bono Haas said, hey, I don't, I'm not really going to race. I can't be bothered. Give the license to someone else. Partington, an Evolution Racing Team member, said, oh, I've got the license. I'm going to go straight to Radicals <laughs> and qualify 17th uh, this race. And he's currently in P8, so um, he's definitely one of the biggest movers and shakers throughout the field. 
But yeah, Jake, early on, though, we did talk about, you know, great fits for teams and drivers and sometimes the issues of being a part of certain teams. Our partner is perfect for radicals in mind because he really does fit the ideology of, you know what, never stop pushing and realise that you're not going to win every single race to take part in. But as a team, radicals, I think, still do have one of the best dynamics of any in the World Championship Series. They have one of the best dynamics, but uh, in terms of consistency from race to race, they have one of the worst consistencies I think I've ever seen. I think P8 is fantastic for Radicals at the moment, but how many times have they been five drivers outside of the top 10, five drivers outside of the top 15 this season? Far too often for my liking. I want to see more of Radicals. I want to see the Kazuki Umishima that's up there getting third place or what have you at Montreal each year. I want to see more of that Radicals. I'm not seeing it at the moment because they don't have the consistency there from race to race. Elka Harpala moves himself past Stephen Michaels for 13th place and Martin Kronke is getting very close now to that one second barrier. As they work past the start finish line it's 1.1 so no DRS this time around but not only Johnny is Kronke mm. going to get within one second he's bringing a friend it's his teammate but the driver <laughs> ahead of him in the championship Mitchell Dion. Bringing the squad with him it's a two on one here bringing the fast break right towards Peter Berryman and they're going to reel him in sometime soon as I said the pass is going to be the difficult point I think uh, Apex have nailed their straight line speed nailed the ERS deployment too Berryman comes through again a difficult left hand this is another corner we need to select a, a great break marker I'm, t I'm telling you Will that Road America race just when we <laughs> I got something better to say we <laughs> We, we hit the apex of the corner and, and we're like, where's where the brake mark is? We're in full throttle right into the apex. Uh, and I'm surprised we, there's such a big long, yeah, there's such a long gravel trap there at Road America. Those are the tracks I like to see. There was yeah. another track as well where all the brake markers got knocked up and I actually received a, a drive-through penalty for cutting the track because <laughs> I didn't see the brake markers. Come on, that's surely there's some leniency for the, for the human beings out there. You know, I'm not a robot. Oh, no, you're a race car driver. I will say one thing as well. Of course, Silverstone, I love the fact that they still got uh, gravel tracks. We saw that early on in qualifying with two drivers who I'm not allowed to talk about because I'm not allowed to give anything away. Marcus Jensen, Ricardo Orozco, though, P number nine on track. They're going at it. First Esports versus Positive Sim Racing and Positive Sim Racing's Ricardo Orozco into a to one, gets close. Marcus Jensen gets two wheels onto the grass there. That's going to hurt his line through Ravazza 2 and all the way down this front straightaway. And Jensen does still have DRS though to Michael Partington. That's going to help him out for the next couple of laps, Jake. But as soon as it's going to be one on one, I think you will see a Roscoe part. Yeah, and right now, Roscoe wants to see that one on one, but he's seeing that Michael Partington is not breaking away, and that's going to be really hurting him in the way he wants to try and attack. And I think Positive Sim Racing have done something very, very clever, Will. They are exploiting the Brazilian market of sim racers, ones that aren't normally seen in the European uh, sim racing scene. They want to go and attack that market, get drivers in, get talents that drive, uh, teams wouldn't normally expect, and it's working for them. Drives like Roscoe, they brought in two new ones over the past couple of weeks and Orozco is reaping the rewards right now. Top 10, he'll take that all day long. Yeah, and there's a lot of things about the Brazilian sim racing community. They are a large one, but they are one that has been plagued by a number of issues in terms of their country's economy over the last couple of years. I know that Iris and Brazil had a number of issues trying to find a way of not only getting people onto Iris, but funding things like the League Championships as well, Johnny. And it's a country, you know, Brazil is a beautiful country. I'm actually going there in November. But it's one that you remember that, you know, sim racing can be a product that you've got to invest money into. Um, be it for, of course, the software, but more importantly for the hardware. And if you can't, if you live in a country where, you know, things, the access to motorsport is low anyway, trying to get into sim racing can sometimes also be difficult. Yeah, no, exactly. And one thing I like now is that I thought when iRacing came about 10 years ago, as the battle for the lead etches closer and closer, <laughs> 1.2 seconds between the top three. One thing I thought 10 years ago is I was saying, oh, this iRacing, the way you pair random drivers with each other and you're able to get a race and with someone at the same skill level, I thought all these local leagues for like Brazil, or all these Finnish leagues, Australian leagues, all these local leagues where they just contain Australian drivers and, and whatnot, I thought they were all going to go defunct. 
But then what we've seen is they've actually come to iRacing and still set up the same leagues for the local drivers and have them race on certain aspects, create their own rules and do it a bit different to those those normal races you can get on iRacing at, at every hour or two hours or so. Um, it's good to see them still about. But of course, you, you talk about money, the economy, Brazil's a, um, Brazil's one of my favorite countries in the world. And they have similar colors to Australia as well. What we wear for sport, <laughs> green and gold, they got the green and gold too. Yeah, you talk about local club competitions, of course. You've got Monday Night Skippies presented by the Calm Zone coming soon to the iRacing Esports Network. Um, every single Monday for the last three years, we've had that one here on Facebook TV. Other club competitions do it as well. Club Finland, it's about that time of the year. Uh, if it's not just happened, Jake, when they all go out to a little cabin, um, about 100 kilometers away from Vanta Helsinki um, in the capital. And they basically go and have, it's pouring as well they go to, and they go and have themselves a nice little couple of days with absolutely no rules and no alcohol. No alcohol, you promise indeed. Well, I, I will say that the Finnish Sim Racing Championship qualifiers have finished and, well, they are looking to try and find themselves into the final very, very soon. Reigning champion Yoni Heikinen will be looking to try and get an opportunity to move forward with that. But keep an eye on your leading three. They are all within a second right now. Into Ravata. Maybe Kronke struggling the most. Maybe Dion with the most to prove about himself here. Can he get past both of these drivers with 11 laps to go? Sorry, I'll correct myself. 12 laps to go as they cross the start finish line which is an earlier start finish line than most people think but Kronke half a second back then at the moment from Peter Berryman is actually holding De Jong up who is unable to really attack Kronke here because Kronke has DRS yeah and I will say one thing is as well Johnny you've got to ask the question how many laps does Kronke get before De Jong gets a shout that's a, are you saying they're going to swap positions? I think you might have to, let's be honest. If you want a commander driver winning the race, then I think if Kronke can't do it, if you're intelligent about this, you have slightly different downforce levels between the two cars. Yeah, no, you're right, exactly. I think car setup, they're almost, almost identical, really. But in terms of tyre rubber, yeah, De Jong's fresher by a, a lap, isn't he? So that's an option they can come into play. I don't think they'd ever do it, though. It's not something that Kuanda would... I mean, they'll definitely think about it. They think about everything, don't they? They're such a calculated team. But at this stage, you know, this this could be a Berryman win unless he throws it away. It could well be. And it will be um, a fantastic win for Apex Racing UK. As we're just having a look then at movers and shakers in this event today. Um, it is a little bit out of whack. We do apologise because Gregor Hutu has not gained 19 places in this field here today. <laughs> Neither has it Jamie Fluke. Uh, so we do apologize for that one, but this is um, their fastest lap of the day. Um, Peter Berman, 120.996. I saw a car go off there. Um, this was in this battle going on in the mid pack, and it is going to be Marcus Jensen losing more places. He's now at the rear end of your top 10. Replay coming up for this one. This is down at that very tricky chicane. We're on board now with Marcus Jensen coming into it. Just overshoots the corner. Decides to take a little bit of rally cross, Jake, instead of going over the anti cross that's not what he wants but he's got DRS back here on Ricardo Orozco moving to the outside trying to make that happen and Orozco can't fight that one back or does he down on the brakes side by side they go into turn number one just about enough room given Orozco runs off wide through the second part of Tamburello and Jensen gains the position now here comes Davi de Court down the inside of Ricardo Orozco and taking the position away as well one position which looked like to be gained suddenly became two lost in two corners yeah and that's quite often the thing here at Imola you end up in a situation where you you think it might have a run, but all it takes, Johnny, is one little overrun of the curves, and all of a sudden, you're into the grass, and the grass here is very slippery. It means that the car has zero traction, but we go back to your race leaders because we've got ourselves Hutu closing up to the rear of Kevin Ellis Jr., but your top three also, Johnny, separated by pretty much nothing. We're on board with Gregor Hutu. This is what we've been talking about all day long. The straight line speed of Team Redline gap is actually going up on the straightaway right now. Yeah, I know. No Redline. Well, as we said, Apex are on the low downforce, so that's why they're so unstoppable in a straight line. And, well, going by the way, Marcus Jensen, I was going to say before, it's just not his day. This is a day to forget. You know, I don't know. I mean, Rogers has had a better race. Could have finished a lot higher, Rogers. They've certainly got the qualifying right, but. 
Uh, didn't expect that Jensen to drop off the amount as he is at the moment. He's sort of recovering. But to the Apex cars, look at your top five now. I, this is your top five drivers of the season. Now, obviously, minus Mac Backham. Mac Backham would be in the top five for sure. So if you had the top six performing drivers of the season, five of them are here in your top five. And then Mac Backham is taking this round as his drop round, not attending today, taking a bit of a break, doing other things. Uh, he's up there too. So uh, some very impressive performances from Berryman and Kevin Ellis Jr. this season. These are not flukes. Every round they're up here at the top for a reason. They are quick. Here we go though. Potential move for the race leader on board of Mitchell de Jong. As you've got yourself Martin Kronke closing right up to the rear of Peter Berryman into Tamarello. Looks to the outside and Kronke goes off. De Jong into second place. What a moment there. Unbelievable, Will, there. Peter Berryman was always going to try and leave just enough room, and there was contact between the pair, right rear to front left, and that's enough to give Kronke a loss. And now look at Dion on the attack, around the outside of Toza. He tries. He doesn't quite find it just yet, but he is probing for information. He is probing for the move, and defensive slightly is Berryman on the run to Piatella. Here comes Dion. He is storming. Here we are, then, so on board again with Mitchell Dion to give you an update on Greg Ahutu versus Kevin Ellis Jr. That one is static right now at seven tenths of a second. So the worries we had, Johnny, about Ahutu trying to get past Kevin Ellis Jr., they have been realized. What we've got now, less than 10 laps to go and De Jong is in charge mode. Um, Kronke couldn't find a way past last time by. The tire difference is three laps between Peter Berman and Mitchell De Jong. They head themselves into Ravazza. If your name is Mitchell De Jong, you are going to have to try and make the move now while the iron is hot, but he does not get the best of runs out of Ravazza 2. And we know Berryman, Ellis Jr., they all struggle towards the end of the stint. Pass for the lead here by Mitchell De Jong. Down the inside, thinks better of it then. But as a consequence of that, Berryman goes off. Mitchell De Jong to the race lead. Not wow! Spending. Look at that big wiggle there from Peter Berryman. And this is going to allow Kronke a chance to get back. Down the inside, they come to Vilna. Can he hold it through the second part? The answer is no, he can't. Kronke around the outside. Koanda 1-2. And it only took four corners. Let's relive that entire sequence. This is going to be on board with Peter Berryman. This is down towards Tamburello. So here he is first. And you see that Kronke looks down to the inside. So that is De Jong looks down to the inside. Thinks better of it. Peter Berryman goes off into the kitty litter. And that gives Kronke the opening as we don't go back on board. And in fact, we're going to stay where we are and show you this one here. Because here is Kronke. Looks down to the inside in Vilner. Now it can be very difficult to make a move into Vilner. But when you've got that much of overspeed, Johnny, you can make it work. Ah, oh, just uh, oh, such a thrilling sequence of corners there. As soon as they broke, I said, I was thinking, oh, Berryman's missed his marker there. He's, he's broken a different time. We've talked about brake markers all race. Something different to usual. That's just an error you should never make at the top level of racing. Uh, Berryman, though, I'm just, I'm just so disappointed for him. I really wanted to see him win a race. And at the moment, it's not over, though. It's certainly not over, Will. We know anything can happen over the next few laps. But so far, Berryman just needed six more laps. And it all came during the strategy period. He was in no man's land. Kronke forced him to pit earlier. He had to, uh, Kronke obviously reacted a lap later. De Jong reacted two laps later. And uh, De Jong right now, if you think about this, he is in prime position to win his first world championship if he carries on this form towards the end of the season. Well, especially as Gregor Hutu is running in P number five right now. And this is perfect for Mitchell De Jong as we round out the first part of the season. There will be six rounds remaining after this one. And I will have the advantage over Gregor Hutu. We've got to remember, of course, that Hutu is battling it out with Kevin Ellis Jr. Over the last couple of laps, they've almost been involved in a deadlock. As you see there, but the gaps in it's a tenth of a second here or there, but not that much. But for Hutu, this is the issue when you have yourself that comfort zone of running towards playing by yourself, Jake. When you have to overtake drivers on track, it can become more difficult. And Hutu does not get any good runs out of Ravatsu 2 compared to that launch in the Apex Racing UK machine of Kevin Ellis Jr. 
Well, there's a lot of dirty air that comes through that second part of Avatar. It's so difficult to put that power down and get the run. You need to be right there on it. And look at Hutu's pace, going to 337 kilometers now before backing out of it because he knows he's not going to get close enough. He's never been close enough to quite make that move. And if you can't do it in the one place where everybody makes the move, Will, you've got to start being creative. And for Gregor Hutu, he now must be creative. He can't afford to drop the 30 points. That is difference between first and fifth. Yeah, but also, Johnny, we think back to earlier in this event, it was the fact that Gregor Hutu went off at Tamarillo Corner trying to make a pass, and that's going to be in the back of his head right now, because, yeah, he's losing 30 points right now, making another mistake, he might be getting zero. Yeah, exactly, he went flying, didn't he? He didn't even go off, he was trying to take off like it was an airport hit the anti-cup strips you take away that time loss and all this time lost now behind kevin ellis jr uh, we were talking off air during one of the ad breaks earlier on and i said i thought hutu was the second quickest driver right now in this race uh, right behind kronke now that was a bit of an understatement because <laughs> mitchell de Jong's insanely quick too you take away that incident and you take away all this time lost, he should be going for the race win and going for a podium. So Hutu, just because he might not get that top three result, it doesn't mean he was lacking any pace today. Yeah, so back on board again. Again, that situation is it starts at about four tenths of a second in the exit of Ravatsa. It comes down to about this point. It goes back up to over four tenths of a second. Hutu is going to have to try and force Ellis Jr. into the state. But Ellis Jr. is not a kind of driver that likes to be pushed and does not get easily pushed into mistakes. Down the call, Ricardo Orozco going at it for the last spot inside of your top 10 right now, Jake. And well, Orozco did gain one lap, but he's lost again all that advantage to down the call ahead of him. Orion Racing doing what they often do, quite running, get a driver into your top 10. Yeah, that's what they do very well. Davy de Corps has shown the pace over this second stint. Now looking to attack Marcus Jensen in the burst esports machine in front of that. You've got a little bit of lap traffic there for Michael Partington. He's got Daniel Bieder just in front. That's not going to be helpful, but he closed seven tenths of a second wheel over Josh Rogers on that last lap. But he gets a huge wiggle through Toza, and that may have just put an end to any sort of charge of getting position number eight away. Up the hill they come as Ricardo Roscoe remains in P number 11. As you're right there, battles also going on. P number eight and nine in trap. Run through some of your retirees out of this fact. Ballas Remnick is now out. Antoine Hegelin is out. David Williams, Kazuki, Umashima, Pascurgas, and Yuta Saito out on lap number one. So, Johnny, after we had that big incident on that first lap, we have actually had ourselves a moderately clean race. Drivers have gone off. They've used the anti cut curve. They've had a couple of spins here and there. But overall, a nice race. Not many incidents. Yeah, it's been a good one. I really enjoyed this one too. And regardless of having 26 cars out there as well, quite a small grid. This is this is what Formula One is like. This is Grand Prix Series racing. You know, you don't really have 50,000 cars out there on the racetrack. Uh, you've got good quality, good, uh, smart, high IQ drivers with insanely quick speed. And that's something that people underestimate at this level as we see David de Corpse, Marcus Jensen, Ricardo Orozco battle. Oh, Jensen's struggling with something. Jensen's got damage. Yeah, he's out. Oh, he's out of the race. On board of Jensen. Oh, goodness. Back, yeah, that suspension damage. I mean, it's going to be almost impossible to win that car back onto track. He's out of this event. Let's have a replay of all of him. So, this is on towards turn number one. Let's listen in. I think that's anti cut curbs. I think he hit the anti-cut curve and then hit David de Corps. Let's get ourselves no. a second look. Go on, Jake. I, I don't think it is, Will. I think it's just merely the contact with David de Corps because the way that that looks, it looks like it's the right rear that's maybe under pressure, and that's where he's starting to lose it all. So I don't think it was an anti-cut curve issue. I think it was just the contact he had with uh, David de Corps that has caused him to have that issue. Yeah, the anti-cut curve started it. It might well have been David de Corps' body work that finished it. Marcus Jensen. Well, when you qualify, and Finally. I remember there was a race, <laughs> um, I think it was for Radicals, when they had a number of drivers inside the top five at Suzuka a couple of years back, Johnny. We thought this could have been their race, and it ended up being so disappointing for them. I think this is first eSports day, but in terms of character building, if you don't learn from this, then you're never going to win a race in the World Championship Series. So this then is now officially their character building race. No, you're right. 
I, <laughs> but I was saying, finally, his race is over. There's a race to forget for Marcus Jensen. I, I don't know what to make of it. You know, he's been quick at some stages. And during that little, sort of that second third of the race, he was insanely quick. And then the first and last thirds were just... Oh, boy. I mean, let's just forget about it. The, the point is, though, he's a... Uh, He's one of the best young prospects out there on the grid. When he came through the Pro Series, Will, he was almost like sort of a, a, an early second round draft pick, if you had to say. Like, he was sort of someone that you'd overlook and say, oh, you know, he's good, he's young, but he's not that quick. And all of a sudden, you see these, oh, top five finishes in the World Championship? Where did this come from? So, you know, he came from being like an early second round draft pick to one of the best young talents out there at the moment so uh, apex had their hands on him first esports snapped him up i think he's going to get even better as the years come may yeah. i say as well that marcus jensen came through a field in a pro qualifying got victories against the likes of frank shuttles on a house mac backham you know it was an absolutely stacked road to pro series and marcus jensen shone out through that throughout he did and it's disappointing but again if you don't learn anything else in a race like this it's all about the fact you've got to Find a way finding positives in what can otherwise be a very difficult race for you. And Marcus Jensen did qualify in your top three here today. Burst Esports are in that same position that Apex Racing UK seemed to have been in two years ago. They've got the qualifying right. Now it's a case of getting the other little details. The race starts, the early race pace, and putting it all together. That is now their next target. For Mitchell de Jong, however, it is the white flag lap. There is one more lap to go for him as he crosses the start finish line to take that white flag. There is one more lap to go, and he's built up, by the way, a 3.1 second advantage over Martin Kronke. Peter Berryman as well. Looks as though he realizes there's not much that he can do. As here comes Hutu over Kevin Ellis Jr. on the last lap of the event. This is really his last chance to try and get himself up into P4, can't do so early. Unless he's going to do a bold move like he did at Watkins Glen International a month ago to try and find a way past. It looks as though that Gregor Hutu is going to have to settle for fifth place, maybe even less if he doesn't, if he makes one more of those mistakes because he was very loose there on the exit of the Villeneuve chicane. Going back though to Mitchell Dion, Akaminarati is complete. Just five more real corners now to go from Mitchell Dion in that number 24 machine. He entered the day equal on point with Gregor Hutu. And this is the last race where you can score yourself drop points. From after this race, every point matters. So any advantage you gained over the first two thirds of the season really will help you. But here comes Mitchell de Jong out of the final corner, final time towards the line. Mitchell de Jong wins here at Imola. Three point one seconds back. There is Martin Kronke. Peter Berryman, after leading for eighty-five percent of this event, has to settle for third place. Apex Racing UK again, coming so close, but not able to do anything at the end. Berryman, a valiant driver for him. Many people call him driver of the day, but he just lost concentration for a moment down at the Tamborello chicane and consequently he still gets a podium but unfortunately that's all he'll get. Kevin Ellis Jr. fourth place so Apex do get two drivers inside your top five. Hutu P number five, Jamie Fluke then P number six as Rogers after all of that there Johnny is going to be P number seven and Burst Esports best driver of the day. Yeah, exactly. Great race from Rogers. Ricardo Orozco in the 10th position, the rookie. Career best result in that positive sim racing car. And he made up another move as well in that final lap as well. He's caught up in all this drama uh, with two laps to go and, and made up a couple positions there in the end. So great race from Ricardo Orozco. Uh, but all the eyes are on Mitchell De Jong. His fifth career win here in the World Championship. How surprising in that, Will? It feels like he's won, you know, 10 or 12 or 15 races. He's only won five. This is number five. He should have had Watkins Glen. He's now bounced back with a victory here. Yeah, of course, you only called it number five, and I've got to get the Johnny Simone Brandon uh, spreadsheet out here. But that does move, him, if I'm correct, <laughs> up into one, two, three, four, into Fourth. your top four. Fourth place. 
in the all-time winners list here in the World Championship Grand Prix Series. Only now, two teammates in Hugo Louise and um, the driver of Martin Kronke and Gregor Hutu in front of him now. Yeah, he's tied with Jesse Neiman and who was a, a pretty quick driver as well back in 2011. Also a teammate, technically. Yeah. Yeah, technically as well. Yes, he named it. was part of the, the Maya 3ID Coanda sort of uh, tree here. But, oh, man, I, I just have to say, De Jong is looking good for a world championship this season. And this is something that, for those who, who don't remember early on, we talked about it in our season previews up until this point. This could be the final time Mitchell De Jong can run a full-time schedule in this world championship. And if you can cap it off with a championship title and the trophy, even more incredible. Yeah, Mitchell de Jong is your winner at Imola. Let's have a look at your final race results. Well, it's showing Mitchell de Jong, Peter Berriman, uh, Martin Cronke, but it's the other way around. It's actually Mitchell de Jong who is your winner. Actually, we know what's going on there. We'll sort that one out for you. Here is 20 seconds. There we are. Let's take two, shall we? In fact, let's stop the music. Let's reset it from the actual beginning and pretend the last minute never happened. There are your final race results then. Mitchell de Jong, 3.4 seconds, 3.5 seconds ahead of Martin Kronke. Koana Sim Sports, out of nowhere, takes a 1-2. And it's Apex Racing UK who claim third and fourth place here. Apex Racing UK have legitimately now got a chance of calling themselves the second best team in the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series for 2018. Berman in third, Ellis Jr. in fourth. Gregor Hutu, P number five for Team Redline, with Jamie Fluke in P number six. Josh Rogers for Burst Esports after having two of their drivers in the top three in qualifying. He could only manage P number seven as issue after issue plagued that Burst Esports team. Michael Partington leading the Radicals online charge in P number eight. Orion Race Team, David Accor in P number nine. And the University of Isabella one positive sim racing car of Ricardo Orozco rounds out your top ten. P number 11, Stephen Michaels, again from the University of Isabella 1, positive sim racing car. Team Even and Ilka Harper are in 12th place for the Orion race team. 13th place will go to the driver of Yao Vaz, also from Orion. Tommy Yersgaard, last driver on your lead lap there for Coanda. Team 33's Moritz Lona comes home in P number 15, one lap down. As did Paul Ilbring for Radicals Online. Daniel Bida for Positive Sim Racing. Mo Garfilo also for Radicals. And Orion Race Team's Dion Verges. Four laps down is Marcus Jensen. We saw what happened to him. Broken suspension towards the end of the event. Badass Remnick then for Vortex Sim Racing. Their only entry today, nine laps down. Antoine Heglin. He's out of the event, 21 laps down. David Williams, out. Kazuki Mishima, out. Pas Gerges, out. And Yuta Saito rounds out your field here. We will step aside for a couple of moments here on Racebot TV and on iRacing Live. And we'll be ready with post-race interviews in just a few moment's time. You've just been watching the eighth round of the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series on the iRacing Esports Network and on Racebot TV.
what are you afraid of? Those feelings are made of. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. Four more kilometers. Oh, 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 this time, like the last time, I'm moving so fast, I'm ready to run. Frankie! Sadly, inside of Hoochie's off! Passenger throws the block, and he will keep him behind him. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Lower the lights down. Hand over my crown. Hand over my heart. I do this for my town. I do this for my crown. So turn me up real loud. My time. What a race. What a race once again in the Racing World Championship Grand Prix Series. And well, I've only checked it for the first time, but apparently it's still going home. But that doesn't really matter because Mitchell De Jong is your winner of the eighth round of the Racing World Championship Grand Prix Series. Congratulations, Mitchell De Jong. Hello, Mitchell. Mitchell. Well. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize you're <laughs> asking me already. Go on, Mitchell. I'm too busy distracting him. Give me some words, Mitchell. How was your race here today? Uh, it was quite, quite up and down, I would say. Um, I think the started in the quali. Uh, it was an okay lap, uh, but didn't quite nail it. So, uh, I guess with how close everyone is here, it's um, pretty important. Um, but nevertheless, we got a, a decent start, had a bit of a, a block from the cars in front, and uh, just tried to be smart, gained a couple spots, and uh, followed Martin, uh, hoping he could uh, run down and pass uh, Peter. Uh, after, I don't know how many laps it was, uh, I started, to, my front started to go off a bit uh, in all the dirty air, so um, also, uh, it got passed by Josh, sat in more dirty air, and then just tried to be patient still, um, and hope our our, our car would um, overcome the others in the long run. And uh, fortunately, it did happen. Josh made a mistake, then gave me clean air. Um, could could catch up, and um, got a really awesome strategy from the guys here. Um, they're actually at my house right now, a bit of a vacation here in California. So um, it was really cool to have that. And uh, yeah, no, it was just um, I don't know, just tried to run the cleanest I could and um, the fastest I could and uh, we had a, a really close one at the end with uh, us three cars and um, yeah, <laughs> could have gone either way and unfortunately really unlucky for Martin um, for that happening to him that was nothing wrong on his, on his part so um, really unfortunate to see that happen but nice to see him still recover and finish second and uh, yeah, just tried to keep it smooth and make it to the end. Well, let's talk about those couple of laps because that happened in quick succession. One lap, it was Martin Cronke who was gunning for the race lead and there was that moment down at Temporado Corner. The next lap, you pushed Berryman into a mistake. Talk us through your thought processes. Yeah, I think, um, you know, going by the past races, like, say, Monza or things like that, I would make, you know, a really small mistake where I'll lock up and you know, I'll have the slowdown in turn one and that completely ruined my entire race. Um, or just some other things when I'm battling with other cars. And uh, I just tried to be a bit more patient this race. Um, you know, uh, it's it's so easy for things to go wrong in this car, especially on old tires like this. Um, so yeah, just tried to, to be hard about it. And um, you could kind of tell that Peter was driving a bit out of his mirror. Um, Obviously, with the the thing with Martin and um, yeah, I, you could see him kind of weaving a bit, depending on where I was going. Um, so I wasn't really planning to dive it into turn one. Um, just tried to scare him a bit, and uh, well, it looked like it it worked. So um, yeah, that was uh, that made it a lot easier for me. So well, you have won the eighth round of the championship. You're doing pretty darn well in terms of 
the uh, R Racing Rallycross Series as well. Now, we've always talked about the Sturgios is being the first driver to maybe win a race in two World Championships. Well, you've done that by winning a race, of course, in the World Championship Series and in the R Racing Rallycross Series. Um, maybe being the first driver in the history of the World Championship Series to win two in one season. Thoughts? That would be very cool. Um, you know, we, we also have a GT3 that we could try to win a race at that. I uh, haven't won in the World Championship for that yet. And, uh, you know, we have a, a lot of big championships this year. Um, and trying uh, try my best to manage all of them. <laughs> it's uh, pretty diverse uh, cars for all three of them. So, um, yeah, just doing my best. Uh, it's a lot of driving, but... Um, Obviously, I'd love for that to happen, and, uh, you know, the ultimate goal is to win it all, but <laughs> that's a long road, so um, just try to take it one at a time and uh, see where we end up. I, I want to ask you the question, which would mean more to you? Well, to be honest, I still would say F1. I think that's kind of the uh, the main thing. Obviously, it's, it's more or less about just how quick you are. Um, so that's kind of the ultimate one. That's the one where I started in, and um, I'll consider that kind of the the, the top there. Um, obviously, GT cars are a bit different to drive. Everyone's usually really close every lap just because um, the way the cars are with all the assists and everything. Um, and they're just different. So uh, I still consider the F1 kind of the hardest to drive. So to, if, if we're able to master that one, that would be pretty epic. <laughs> Well, before we let you go, here I want to give a shout out to from that Kawanism Sports organization. Yeah, uh, for one, um, all our teammates. Obviously, we didn't have uh, Marty and Mac this one, unfortunately. So, uh, with with the limited people we had, uh, everyone did a great job with uh, developing the car and um, getting us where we are. Uh, the spotters for uh, waking up at my uh, normal California time now. They're not used to being up so early, uh, so they woke up at five and drove down here so um big thanks to them uh they did a, a huge uh, a huge thing for us in the race today um and all our partners virtual racing school hoisingfeld and we're designed simquip uh joral timing race spot uh and uh yeah the lord well thank you very much that mitch de Jong looking for the double still in terms of the rs world championship grand prix series and the i racing rallycross series as well I um, want to show you the start before we go much further once again. We never had the chance to really show you the crashes that happened, but I want to start off by showing you a couple of onboards. This one is going to be with your race winner, Mitchell de Jong. You see, he gets about a standard run, but it's actually Marcus Jensen that gets the slowest run of anyone in towards turn and one. Now, Mitchell Dion gets boxed in as a consequence, and they all come into us that first came for the first time. And then Dion just finds himself as the two first eSport drivers kind of fall over each other. The chance there, Jake, to get up to P number three. Yeah, the chance to get to P number three, and I think that it was down to pick and choose your moment. I think that Marcus Jensen didn't have the best of starts. He left himself a bit of a sitting duck. And I think that maybe there was a lot of influence in terms of Josh Rogers and the way that he wanted to start, thanks to Peter Berriman slightly overcooking it into the opening corner. I think Berriman was very lucky to keep it on the island as well, but Josh Rogers really paid the price for using Berriman as a braking marker. I think that allowed Cronkay through, that's allowed De Jong through, and that allowed the opportunity for drivers to develop, move forward, and actually create a very entertaining race at the end. Yeah, here's a look from on board. Joshua Rogers in towards turn number one. You see he has the outside line. Takes the racing apex. Then goes a little bit wide. Pushes off track and that's what causes that bunch up and there's the young going past. We want to have a look at Kazuki Umashima at this stage. He's already off. So let's have a look at Kazuki Umashima because he was involved there in an incident at the start of this one. Here he is in towards turn number one. That front right suspension gone before he even hits Tamburano there, Johnny. Yeah, not a good incident for Umashima. He was one of the many drivers. Uh, Pascal Sturgis involved in the incident too on lap one as well. He, um, yeah, he was uh, collected by, I think, Mugafilio was rejoining the racetrack. Then again, somebody else making contact with him at Villeneuve. So he had a race to, uh, that was all over. And but, uh, think about that, Will. You've had uh, two, three weeks of practice and you come in, your race is over lap one. What a waste of time. All that practice, all that mental energy put into an event. 
and it's all over. But that, that's how that's what racing is, you know. And um, you don't. I never understood the feeling of, of crashing out a lap one of an event until it actually happened to me, and I'm like, this, this sucks. It's it's just uh, you you sit there and and you, you like I you've got all this adrenaline going, and there's nothing to to throw it out on. You know, there's no car to drive on. Um, the the best thing I did was I just quit the race, didn't even watch the event, and just did some laps on my own for 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, that is, of course, we talked about earlier. The Brazilian flags indicate where Ayrton Senna crashed at Tamarillo Corner. The reason why they included the chicane in 1995 after his death. Of course, also more changes due to what happened with Roland Ratzenberger the day before and also Women's Barakano on the Friday before the event. Now, I've, I've given them enough time, I think. Peter Berman comes home in third place here today, stood by with Jake. Peter, it seemed for all the world that it was destiny for your first race victory in the World Championship, but two laps and then, you know, four corners later, you're finding yourself in third position with no hope of getting yourself back to the top two. Yeah, I was, uh, was a pretty solid qualifier, and uh, I was pretty confident I could score a pole, and yeah, I was glad I went out and did that, you know, it was pretty tight with the uh, burst guys, but uh, yeah, I felt in control of the race. Uh, I mean, I almost bent the car in turn one. I think uh, I need to apologize to Josh, I think it was, behind me. Uh, very close to taking the both of us out. Uh, had a big sausage curb. Uh, just lost the car. Uh, luckily, uh, nothing happened to me. I'm not sure what happened to him, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I felt in control. Uh, Front gate was close the whole, I knew it would be close uh, the whole stint, so. I just needed to focus on hitting the mark because I knew it was a lot quicker in a straight line, so the chances of him overtaking without me making a mistake were very unlikely. So, yeah. Like, again, the Kwandas seemed to have a very good setup to manage the tyres, so the last five to ten laps of a stint, they are pretty mega, and there's not really much you can do. It's kind of a, a, a pretty bad feeling, you know, being vo that vulnerable and nothing you can do about it. But, uh, yeah. I'm not really sure what Martin was thinking with uh, the pass. Uh, he seems to think uh, I was at fault for that, but to be honest, I, I didn't even know anything about it. I checked the mirrors, and uh, Martin's car was behind me, so I felt that everything was safe in the braking zone, and then just as I'm about to turn in, I get the, the call that a car's on my right, and uh, yeah, a bit of contact, which killed my tyres quite a lot, and then De Jong was just easy pickings. Well, you know, you find yourself, of course, that battle for the race victory. And, you know, you're in that battle with Mitchell de Jong and you, you start seeing after the contact you've had that he's starting to smell blood. He's starting to get a bit more aggressive attack you at Toza. Um, do you feel that after the mistake, oh, sorry, the incident that you had with Martin Crockett, I can't necessarily call it a mistake. That's a little bit unfair. Um, do you feel that when you got yourself to that next lap, did you feel that there was anything that changed mentally for you that put you maybe in a more difficult position maybe to fully focus on that next corner well initially after the hit i thought the rear of the car was broke but i think it was just the tires had the temperature had skyrocketed and it was as if i was driving on ice but yeah so you sort of i sort of went into panic mode a bit because there was nothing i could really do you know I just had to stick it out and then obviously you've got a guy with a really good set of tires behind you uh, breathing down your neck. Going into T1, I, I hit my normal breaking point, I thought. But uh, yeah, instant lock up and straight on I went. There was nothing I could really do. It was just, it was just a passenger from that point. And you, you're finding yourself with more and more greater results. You're starting to put yourself in that position. You're trying to move yourself forward. And you head to Zandvoort in two weeks' time, a track which nobody really has too much experience about, a circuit that isn't tried and tested in terms of a Formula One vehicle. Do you feel that Zandvoort holds some very similar characteristics to Imola, how it's going to be a high downforce race, how it's going to be all about track position? And do you feel that that qualifying effort that you can put in, do you feel you can replicate that to give yourself the best possible opportunity in two weeks time well the work that the guys have been putting in i think uh this is the closest the group has ever been ever since the team got smaller i think really uh really came together and we've been working super hard and i think we're making big gains but uh i mean zandvoort's pretty much the monaco i would say of the season uh once you get ahead there's not really much anybody can do anywhere but i haven't even bought the track i don't have the track purchase so 
I have no <laughs> idea what it's going to be like. I've, I've never turned a lap there before. So, yeah, heading into there with a bit of uh, who knows, I guess. Well, it's going to be two weeks of very intense training then. So before we let you go, Mr. Berryman, who can? Uh, any shout-outs or sponsors? Yeah, once again, uh, the guys. I can't say it enough how hard the guys work. I mean, yeah, it's been pretty awesome. So shout-out to those guys. Uh, shout out to the sponsors, Neil Bodner, JCL, Simcuters, and SDK Gaming. And of course, thanks to yourselves for the, the broadcast. Cheers. Not a worry at all. Peter Berriman there, Will, coming home in third position. Looked for all the world today like he was going to get a maiden victory. Yep, and the curse continues in some ways for Apex Racing UK here. Um, from one Apex Racing UK driver to another, however... We have got the driver of Kevin Ellis Jr. who, well, before we go to interview him, Johnny, had the unenviable task of trying to find a way of holding off Gregor Hutu over the last stage of this event, but managed to make it look kind of easy. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. I want to, I want to actually go back to Kevin's here live with us now. I want to actually go back to the start of the race with Kevin first, and then we'll talk about the, the Hutu uh, sort of dilemma he had to face for that whole event. The start of the race, Kevin, you didn't get off the line well at all and somehow recovered it over the course of the first lap. You should have lost like five, six positions on that first lap off the line. Yeah, probably my worst start of the season. So, um, no, nah, I, I don't know. I just had a bit too much clutch in it. And then when I saw that the green lights came on and I wasn't moving, I was like, oops, I've got a bit too much clutch and took a bit too much clutch off and then got a ton of wheel spin. So, yeah, I think I lost four spots or something before we even got to the pit exit. Um, and then going into the first corner there was a few issues on my left hand side I don't know who was involved, I think it was Kazuki um, and that seemed to slow them up and I just braked a bit later and had a bit of clear track on the outside and I just threw it up the outside and which then turned to the inside and I managed to get the spot back and I was behind Jamie so a net loss of none so that was quite positive <laughs> to get that back in the in turn 2 or turn 3 whatever corner it is so um, yeah I kind of saved my race there I think Let's now talk about the Hutu incident. That is, well, not an incident, actually. What am I saying? The, the Hutu dilemma you face at the end of the race. This is a guy who, I mean, we mentioned it during the broadcast. He had pretty much race-winning pace, did Gregor Hutu. He was just in the wrong positions at the wrong time. He had the incident at Turn 1 where he went flying over the anti-cut curbs. You weren't mirror driving, of course, were you, going into those final stages of the race? You, you were keeping your head cool, I hope. Yeah, I was just trying to focus forward as much as I could. Um, when he got into DRS, uh, I could see on the straights that when I was uh, using my, my ERS, he wasn't really getting any closer. So I figured he had a bit more downforce on. Um, so from that point on, really, I knew that I just had to use my normal ERS deployment strategy and he wouldn't really be able to get even alongside. Um, but I was kind of tentative the last two or three laps. Um, I was mm. fearful that he could just throw up the inside in, in, a, in one of the corners that you shouldn't really be able to pass on. So I was keeping half an eye on him. Um, I'd say through the through the twisty stuff, but as soon as I got at the straight, I had a bit of a break, regained my myself mentally, and just tried to to nail the rest of the lap again. But I had a few issues with my rim this race. About an hour before the race started, my my rim seems to be losing power, and it happened about four times during that race. One of which when Hutu was it, I just lapped Moritz, um, and then my rim disconnected. I was stuck in fourth gear for about five or six seconds, and that's how uh, Hutu got so close to me over the course of that lap. So. Um, yeah, going to need to take a look at it and see if we can fix it, for example, because uh, I, I can't shift gears, I can't, I can't do anything when that happens. I can still steer, but I've got no, no power to the rim, so we never be looking at That reminds me of Michael Schumacher. Remember at Barcelona? What was he on? <laughs> was it sixth gear, seventh gear the whole race or something? He still won? Did a Michael Schumacher there. Surely you've dealt with, with something worse over your, your times in your career? Um, I've been quite fortunate with hardware, luckily. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I could still shift gears. It was just for like a second it would drop out and then come straight back. And I was fortunate the first three times that happened in a, a spot where I was like right at the apex of a corner where I didn't need to change gear or anything. So I could get off the corner fine and it came back before it need, needed to shift up. Um, but yeah, on that last one, it just happened right at the worst point and I just couldn't get out of fourth gear. And then when the, whip, the wheel did come back on, I still couldn't shift. So um, hmm. yeah, that was a... a definitely didn't help the case having her two behind was tough enough never mind having a, a dodgy wheel so yeah very fortunate i managed to, to hang on there and uh, finally last thing i uh, give you thank yous out and any shout outs to the team where you need to yeah massive shout out to all the guys as pete said we've been working really really well lately um i think this is the best i've ever seen the team in the last just over a year since i've been on the team now so 
yeah, we've been working really, really well. Everyone's fully transparent. No data gets held back or anything. It's just it, all the data is there and everyone uses it. Everyone seems to be near enough on the pace on the day. It's just uh, it just comes in the execution really. So now massive thanks to the team and massive thanks to all the sponsors as well. But I just want to give a special shout out to uh, one of my, my long time friends, uh, Wallace Green. Uh, he lost his mum on uh, Thursday. He was a full-time carer for us, and he lost her on Thursday morning. Um, so he's been struggling with that, and he still managed to turn up to the race today and support me. So that, that really does mean a lot. So a massive shout-out to Wallace. Um, his mum was a, a great wee character. She used to shout over the microphone well done and stuff after races. So, so yeah, it was, it was a mm. big shame for Wallace. But, um, no, I just want to dedicate this result to, to Wallace and his mum. And, uh, yeah, thank you. There you go, Will. Kevin Ellis Jr., what a race. Uh bit of an emotional ending for him there of course as well but uh, you have to say the apex racing uk team working so well together he talked about the transparency too kevin ellis jr that's what it, you know they're extracting every single ounce of of juice out of that orange at the moment at apex racing uk uh, the funny thing is though if there is someone that uh, if you do think everyone's being transparent and no one's hiding anything maybe someone is <laughs> they're just doing it so well conspiracy <laughs> theories start you don't know <laughs> The conspiracy theories already start. Oh, one thing I will say as well is that we are in for a fantastic end to the season as well. From here on in, there is no such thing as drop weeks. So we've done three of them over the last couple of weeks um, here on Race Watch TV. Um, we've done Silverstone. Let's hit that one off immediately for you, shall we? Boom. Done. Done. There we are. We've got Imola. Boom. Done. Rock weeks are no more. Danforth, Indianapolis, Suzuka, Nurburgring, Spa, and Circuit of the Americas. We haven't been back, though, Jake, to Zandvoort in so long. One of my favourite tracks. In fact, it is my favourite road track for a car like this. Not set for Formula One racing in terms of its safety compliance, but one of the good things about the Irish World Championship Grand Prix Series is we get to run it. Oh, yes, we do. And I will say that Imola is my favorite circuit. So we go from my favorite to your favorite. And I challenge you to find a better race than Imola so far. What a fantastic event we've had. And Zandvoort's going to be that sort of... Oh, how do we put it? It's like IndyCar. You could say it's the it's, it's the one that you don't often get respect for. And I think that Zanvoort is really going to earn the respect to the drivers. And they have to work incredibly hard through every corner to make sure it works properly. There's fast speed corners, slow speed corners. It's got everything that you need under the sun. And a bank turn number one as well. Will, I know you love your IndyCar as well. <laughs> well, Tri can, can we do trivia time quickly before we go? Go on. Go on, do your trivia. Okay. Trivia time. You, Jake, you've got two seconds to answer this, and then I'm going to give Will two straight seconds after you. Who won Zandvoort the last time it was on the calendar in 2014? I wasn't in sim racing at that time, so I'm going to hazard a guess and say... Time's That's longer than two seconds. seconds. I'm going to say who to. <laughs> it was Enzo Benito. Oh, my wow. word. Yeah, it was Enzo Benito. He'd had yeah. a horrible season, but that was one race. You're right. Yeah, he had, like, what? He, he collected... I think one of the most DNFs of the season that year. Yeah. Um, he, he, like, crashed out of so many races. I don't know what happened to him. And that was sort of what he was remembered for. The guy who had so much pace and would win the race every now and then. And another race he'd crash out and have a technical issue. Uh, but anyway. Does that remind uh, you of a certain end. driver that's also now at Team Redline? Oh, <laughs> I'm not going to name names. I might insult someone by accident. Uh, but oh, I mean the one that's the quote-unquote honorary driver. I, yeah, I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to... I'm not getting myself in trouble, Will. So, uh, it's actually good. By the way, it's good to see it back on the calendar. You said it was one of your, your favorite tracks. More importantly, is this a good track for Grand Prix Series racing? That's the question. Um, I love Zanvor, but man, the overtaking, you know, what's the strategy going to be? Is Audi S or Tarzan oh, no. Corner, that's basically it. Unless, I mean, if you push wide at a turn of a five, you might have a run down into Vodafone Corner. But realistically, you've got two passing zones there, Johnny. The um, Audi S or into Tarzan. Yeah, oh, well, true. Maybe, the, I don't know. Like, I don't want to hear about a lack of overtaking from someone who's never driven at the racetrack. So <laughs> we'll find out anyway in a few weeks' time. One of the fascinating things about that race as well will be the fact that you can start off um, on the outside line into Tarzan Corner. If you can keep yourself side by side, it gets narrow from turn two and three. Picture on the inside for turn number four. There might be your overtaking opportunity. 
we have got ourselves Samura here on the Iris and Esports Network, the 2K World Cup here. One of the longest running series in the history of Racebot TV. Join us for that one tomorrow at 8 p.m. GMT. And don't forget to subscribe to the iRacing Esports Network now if you want more iRacing action. This is all we've got time for tonight here then from the eighth round of the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series. Before we go, shout out to Isran Balao and Track Cams 22com to Andres Warner and And One Design for our overlay design, to Simon Grossman and AppGeneering.com and Nick Thisson for Racebot TV live timing and scoring. In terms of the championship, as it stands right now, Guillaume has himself the championship lead by 40 points with Martin Kronke. So we've got the Hutu in second place, 40 points back, and Martin Kronke, a further seven back. Packham has a lot of work to do, but we know that he has been exceptional this season. This has been one of those seasons when anything can happen and when it looks as though the Apex Racing UK we're going to win here at Imola, all of a sudden two laps, boom, it was gone. Kawanda 1-2 once again. It is De Jong who takes victory here today over Martin Kronke but we've got to remember the fact that we've had speed here today by Apex and also by Burst Esports. From Jake Sperry and Jonathan Simone, this has been a production of Racebot TV on the iRacing Esports Network. I am Will Vincent, and we'll talk to you all next time. Goodbye from Imola.